Welcome to the Stories and Sips Irish Whiskey Lock in Live Stream. It's Friday evening, and we gather every Friday to chat about whiskey, to raise a glass, to toast each other, our health, and to uh, hang out and have a bit of a crack with some fun guests. We've got a fun evening ahead tonight. In a few minutes, I'm going to be bringing on our special guest for the evening to talk us through some of his favorite whiskeys, how to know, how to taste, how to appreciate whiskey. David Morrow will be joining us in a couple of minutes. So do let us know where you are joining us from, wherever you are in the world. I see some familiar faces lined up and, uh, and ready to go. JP in Cork, one of the most anticipated guests ever, he says, referring to David and clearly not me. Peter is starting in the uh, glass side. Is the lock in? Fantastic. So we had Louise McGuan from JJ Curry on with us last week, and she shared with us the journey of the lock in. So it's great to see. See that that has gone into people's hands already. I know the cask strength version of that sold out pretty quickly. Great to see people people drinking that. Let me see. Some people think there are some. Let me figure this out really quick. Okay, let me change my settings. Hopefully that is better. Uh, let me know if the sound is good for you here. Hopefully that sound uh, works. Sound is all over the shop, says Laurie. Peter says the same. Okay, let's fix this audio. We'll get this audio working. Let me know if you can hear that, if that's any better. Uh, we've got James joining us. Um, great, all good now, yeah. So I've got these AirPods that keep giving up on me. I'm gonna have to get some new ones. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll use our built-in speakers on the, uh, on the computer. That's great, okay, so. Great night ahead of us. We're going to bring in in a minute or two. We're going to bring in David Mara. Before we do that, uh, let me know where you are in the world. What's in your glass? I'm always curious to know what you're drinking. We've got three great whiskeys that we're going to go through tonight. David's going to lead us on a tasting and nosing journey from his own experience and perspective. We're going to talk about three whiskeys. We're going to start this evening with Waterford Whiskey, Rath Eden. I have a small sample of it here. You might have it in a blue bottle. And then we will be moving on to Powers John's Lane release. Look, a little dribble left in the glass that, on the bottle. That could be finished tonight. And then we will end our evening with W.D. O'Connell. Peter, single malt, Bill Phil, which should be a wonderful way to end the evening, especially seeing as I'm still not convinced of Pete's uh, value in whiskey, but I know that David will convince and convert me as many have tried before so it's great to see so many joining us uh, this evening um, this week we were lucky enough to i was lucky enough to spend some time with a legend of the irish whiskey industry and that is uh, mr john quinn john quinn is the global brand ambassador for tullamore dew and i spent a, a fantastic afternoon talking to john this uh, this week and i released this podcast episode John is a legend, an icon in the world of Irish whiskey. He has spent 46 years working in Irish whiskey. When he joined the Irish whiskey industry, distilling was still happening in the Powers John's Lane Distillery in Dublin. That tells you how long he's been involved in Irish whiskey. He's seen the highs, the lows, the roller coaster of Irish whiskey, and he's got some fantastic stories to tell. I was able to extract some of them out of him, out of him and learn a lot about his perspective, his thoughts on the new demand and, and interest in Irish whiskey around the world. So if you haven't already checked out our interview, my chat with John, you can do so by visiting storiesandsips.com or wherever you get your podcast from. So uh, hopefully you check that out. I know a lot of you uh, gave, gave great feedback on that uh, earlier this week. So that uh, is that was this week's podcast. Next week, uh, the coming week, we are going to be uh, releasing a chat with Dahi O'Connell, the man behind W.D. O'Connell. I talked to Dahi about uh, the building of a whiskey business, about pleated whiskey, about his plans for the future. We had a great chat this week, and uh, we'll be releasing that podcast this week, so stay tuned for that. Additionally, if you were on the live stream last week, our very special guest was Louise McGuan, founder of JJ Curry Whiskey Bonders, and Louise shared the journey of the lock-in. And for those of you who stuck around until after, until the very end of her interview, we had a fantastic announcement, a very exciting announcement of our very own whiskey, our very own whiskey for stories and sips and for the Irish Whiskey Fans of America Facebook group. And it's a whiskey that's designed or that will be 
designed to celebrate the growth of Irish whiskey in America, but the story of that growth and the story of the community that's building up around Irish whiskey. And of course, the whiskey is called The Story, and it's a collaboration between us here at Stories and Sips, and by us, I mean me, and JJ Corey. And so we're really excited to, uh, to announce that last week. There'll be more details shared of that over the coming weeks. We've been working on the label this week. We've been working on, a, on the, the component whiskies, and I will tell you that there are some really exciting component whiskies going in here. Nothing is final until it reaches the bottle, but let's just say that there is a 1991 whiskey, almost a 31 year, a 30 year old, almost a 30 year old whiskey that will play a role in this, uh, the story, which is really, really exciting. So I'm excited for the journey of the story and the chapters of that that are going to unfold over the coming weeks and the coming uh, months up until Christmas, when we hope uh, to get this on the shelves. Larry, our, our friend here in California, is helping us get this on the shelf and make it available. So what you might see this week, early this week, is uh, a registration link to register your interest because we may have very few of these bottles available, such as the quality of the liquid inside and the challenges of getting uh, many of them over here. But we'll be uh, looking for you to register your interest. It doesn't mean you have to buy it, but rather register your interest. So that's coming over the next few weeks. The story uh, is going to be told and the bottle is going to hit the shelves very, very soon. So you didn't come here just to listen to me. You came here to listen to uh, my friend in, and Irish whiskey community, um, stalwart and fanatic. And his name is David Morris. So I want to bring David in to talk to us and introduce us to himself. David, uh, before I, I do bring him in, just a quick introduction. I, I came, I, I met David through Twitter initially, as many of my friendships over Irish whiskey have happened. It was over Twitter and eventually met David at our Irish whiskey tasting in the Middleton Distillery last year, together with uh, Omar Fitzel and Dave O'Connell and so many of you who were able to join us there. That was the first time meeting him in person. And David's a fierce defender of Irish whiskey, but also has some very strong opinions on what it should and shouldn't be. And I'm delighted uh, that we have him here to share some of those opinions with us as well. So David Mara, you are very welcome. <laughs> How are you? Well, thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Barry, not too bad. It's, uh, it's as you know, just after midnight here, um, joining you from uh, from Inishowen in the in the very north of Donegal. So uh, I suppose apologies in advance if there's any connectivity issues, but uh, you know, way here up north in Donegal, I think the the broadband providers maybe maybe have, might have left us out a little bit, as 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 so many entities do and forget about us up here. So, uh, but sure. delighted to delighted to join you anyway. <laughs> well, I'm sure everyone's picking up on that very obvious Donegal accent that you've got. There. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Yeah, yeah. So I, I heard the I heard the intro and 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 uh, I saw somebody saw somebody uh, mention a comment that I was one of the most anticipated guests ever. So I'm 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 fierce nervous about disappointing a couple of people. I don't know what they expect me to do. <laughs> Trust me, you, I disappoint people every week. You'll disappoint people. We only disappoint people every week, and it's fine. The bar is set very low, so there's no good, issue at all. Good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, good to hear. So I've got the, the colors that people are seeing on the screen, this yellow, this maize color that you see at the bottom of your screen is the uh, one of Michigan's colors, and people from Ohio That's true, will, yeah. be, will be throwing <laughs> things at the screen, such as the... They will. Uh, yeah. Tell people who don't know, especially the, our Irish audience, there's a rivalry between Michigan and Ohio, isn't there? Um, there is, yeah, I, um, I suppose it, it, it specifically stems between um, uh, University of Michigan uh, in Ann Arbor and uh, Ohio State University uh, down in Columbus, and it would be um, be one of the most heated heated um, university sports rivalries uh, in America, and one of the most heated sports rivalries, whether it's college or or professional. So, um, uh, a couple of uh, very passionate groups of groups of fans and stuff like that so but uh but no look i mean it's 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 all in good fun hopefully <laughs> when david says passionate fans what he means are burnt out cars upturned cars on fire yeah. in different cities depending yeah. on the, uh, the 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 particular heat of that rivalry that year <laughs> yeah by passionate i mean rabbit yeah <laughs> <laughs> So I, I asked David to join us tonight because uh, the lock-in is about bringing, it's about having a bit of crack, right? It's, it's as if we're locked into a pub. You want to be locked into a pub with somebody that you'll have a bit of crack with, you'll be able to have a chat with, <laughs> maybe uh, a bit of a laugh. Uh, maybe somebody will say something that somebody else will argue with, but it's a good thing because it's passion. And, and I like bringing people on who are passionate about things. And David, you are a man that is passionate about whiskey and 
alcohol, uh, and I mean that in the best way. <laughs> I mean that as a positive term, not a pejorative term. Um, yeah, yeah. But you have a deep interest in, in alcohol, and it started a long time before whiskey, did it? It did, yeah. So, um, you know, back when I was in the U.S. before I moved here, I've been, I've been in Ireland nearly 20 years now. Um, but before I moved here, I was working in a, uh, in a small brew pub in uh, suburban Detroit, uh, started off as a as a bartender there, and then moved into the to the brewery as a, as an assistant brewer. So did that for two or three years before I came to Ireland, and um, so you know I already had quite an interest in in craft beer and things like that, and understood a bit on the production side. Um, when I moved to Ireland at that time, there was no craft beer movement in Ireland whatsoever. I think there was maybe two uh, craft breweries, um, so there really wasn't much of a scene. In terms of in terms of beer, so I needed um, something else to get into, and that was when I really delved into into wine in a big way. Um, I ended up uh, managing a wine shop for about six years, um, and you know really got into the detail of, of of wine and and terroir and stuff like that. We'll probably mention that word a couple more times throughout the throughout the evening. But uh, so really explored wine quite a lot um, for for the better part of a decade. Um, you know, throughout that time, I'd always enjoyed whiskey. I had never gotten particularly serious about it, but I did enjoy it. Um, I think the first whiskey I ever liked was, um, if there's anybody from, uh, from from Michigan here, they'll know Windsor, Ontario, where all the kids go to uh, to drink when they're 19. Um, so I would have uh, discovered Lagavulin uh, at that time and, you know, really started drinking whiskey then, but got serious into it maybe maybe about three years ago. Um, after having got out of the wine business, now I'm working in uh, in working in IT. Still very much into wine, still collect wine and things like that. But got a little more serious into the whiskey side about uh, about three years ago. So I suppose I have some experience in and kind of delved in a few different areas within the within the drinks industry and spent a total of about five or six years behind the bar as well, um, pulling pints and, and and making drinks and stuff like that. So a little bit of uh, uh, some different perspectives, I think. I think it, it that should set the scene for why. Your why an American accent is qualified to talk about Irish whiskey because we've got Irish whiskey fans who are saying, "What's an American doing coming in and telling us?" <laughs> Irish but you have opinions, and didn't sure haven't we been letting foreigners into Ireland for many years to do things with whiskey? From John Jameson to our favorite distillers and distiller's wife down in Dingle, the Cool family. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you've got yourself the foreigners. How, let, how we how we let him in? I I don't know still, but <laughs> well, the, the, I just uh, friends, uh, a good guy, a great guy. <laughs> The passport requirements must be uh, must be very. The <laughs> requirements are low at the moment. Um, so you've got one of the things that you're known for at the moment, and and you're quite vocal about about whiskeys and about what you're passionate mm -hmm. about, what you do and don't like, which is which mm -hmm. is a great thing. And for those people who are joining tonight on Facebook or YouTube who don't know what Irish whiskey Twitter is. Irish Whiskey Twitter is this remarkable community that is built up around a number of events that take place on a weekly basis in Ireland, Friday night dram, Saturday night sip, Sunday night sup, and those are the hashtags. And it brings people out of the woodwork to talk about whiskey and what they like. And you've been quite of, you, you've participated in some of these conversations over the years, mm -hmm. these conversations. And one of the things you have become quite known for is your literal hatred of any whiskey that has an alcohol by volume of, of less than 99% is, is the way <laughs> I look at the point. So you, you're, you're big into cask strength whiskey, aren't you? Well, I mean, I am very, I think, um, you know, the idea behind the, the cask, strength, cask strength crusade hashtag, um, you know, really came out of me questioning why we have certain uh, expressions that would be fairly high end, fairly premium, quite highly priced, um, bottled at, at, at 40%. And, you know, I started kind of questioning why we have all these high end whiskeys and how is it that the optimum proof to drink them at just so happens to correspond with the, the legal minimum allowed by law. Right. And, and so, and so <laughs> I kind of got a little bit, a little bit skeptical about that. And, um, you know, I think, you know, for me, cash strength whiskey, you know, I've, I've, I've had it said to me that not every whiskey should be necessarily consumed at cash strength, and I would, I would agree with that. Um, you know, I think each whiskey has its own kind of optimum proof that it's that it's to be consumed at. Um, there may be more than one. There could be a number one, a number of proofs that it, that it works at. And for different people, it can it can vary by the day. You know, sometimes you might feel like 
something a bit more punchy. Sometimes you might feel something a bit more subtle. So, you know, for me, I just look at it in the way that I would prefer to be the one to make that decision uh, as I'm drinking my whiskey rather than having an accountant uh, do it for me with with all due respect to to accountants. Um, now we're know, I, 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 Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 for me, you know, you know, if you're going to be if you're going to be serious about whiskey, I think you know you want to be able to experiment um, with 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 drinking whiskeys at different ABVs. Um, and if you're coming in right at the right at the bare minimum, I think you know you're you're missing out potentially on quite a lot of other flavor experiences. Um, you know, not to say that you need to drink everything at 65 percent. Maybe you want to drink it at 41 one day, but you can you can dilute your 65% whiskey down to down to 41 if if you think that's that's how you want to do it that day. But if you get it at 40, you know you're kind of stuck there. You're not going to really be able to to go yeah. up. And you know I've had a number of whiskeys that were that were fantastic um, at 40%, and you know good and all as they are, some of them are are, are delicious um, Irish whiskeys and and otherwise. But I always kind of I can't help but having this kind of nagging feeling of you know what might have been. What would this taste like at 46? What would it have tasted like at 48? And, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, unless we're lucky enough to um, participate in something like Belfast Whiskey Week, when they had their their cash strike samples and things like yes. that, it, it, a lot of times you'll just never know. You never know what you might be missing or what, what really could have been, which is, you know, I think kind of a shame, you know? So, but you know, it, it, and there's the price thing as well, Barry, you know, I mean, like, you know, if you're talking about Blackbush at 30 euros, uh, it's quite appropriate for that to be at at forty percent. You know, I'm, I mean, there's there's definitely um, a value a value thing to be to be appreciated there. But I think you know once you start creeping into the to the higher price ranges, um, certainly for me, my expectation in terms of the drinking experience that I'm going to have certainly increases. Yes, and I know one of the whiskeys that constantly comes up in this discussion is Middleton Very Rare, one of the mm -hmm. high priced. Uh, annual releases that we see in Ireland have seen for many years, and that uh, the shock for many that that comes out at forty percent, especially to to over to those from Scotland and from 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 the United States when they look at that, they're more used to seeing higher priced, high end whiskies at a higher ABV, aren't they? Yeah, actually, Barry, you know, I, I wasn't going to call out Middleton uh, by name on that one, but that was actually the um, that was actually the whiskey that uh, that kind of kicked that whole thing off for me. Um, and I remember asking the question on Twitter, um, probably a, 10 days before I started that, before I started that hashtag, like, why is, how is it that since 1984, the optimum drinking strength <laughs> of every release of Middleton Very Rare just so happens to coincide with the minimum proof, uh, allowed by law. I thought that was a little bit suspicious and so not, not to call them out uh, specifically, but it is certainly one of those whiskeys where when you taste it, it's, it's, it's very good. And, you know, I just can't help but wonder, uh, Bushwills 21 is another one. I just can't help but wonder what that would be like at 48. It doesn't need to be cash strength, but, you know, 48% even. Um, but, you know, what I will say is that, is that you know, since I've kind of pushed this, this cash strength crusade thing, I certainly wouldn't um, presume for a moment that, that, that it's because of, you know, me and my little Twitter hashtag. But what I have seen recently, and I think we've all seen, is quite a lot of producers um, starting to release uh, whiskeys at cash strength, and you know something that that doesn't surprise me about that is how quickly they're selling out. Um, you know, understandably, they're smaller batch quantities, they're kind of limited editions. Um, you know, they are more expensive for people to buy, so not everyone's going to necessarily be in the market for it. However, it, it is encouraging to see. You know, when 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 you see some of these getting released, they're selling out in in minutes, literally in minutes. You know, you right. might have a two two three hundred bottle release or a hundred and fifty bottle release. And they're selling out really quickly, um, and I, you know. So what that says to me is that there is a lot of pent up demand for for these these higher strength whiskeys. People that are looking for a little bit more out of their their experience. And we meant we mentioned Middleton not to 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 point the finger in any in any one no. way, or, or, but rather to highlight that it it is a delicate balance, I guess, between the the economics of running a distillery and the pleasing of everybody that want that needs to be pleased along the way. And um, I would imagine that the 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 squeaky wheel gets the oil and historically if people weren't asking for higher proof whiskies uh, then there was no need to produce them and yeah. i like what i like about what has started to happen around this cask strength crusade is the conversation that happens is so vocal and yet quite objective in the sense of it's not mean it's not mean spirited it's not it's not rude rather it's saying hey i'm a consumer i like this whiskey at a higher or i would like to see this whiskey at a higher abv 
what do you think distilleries and brands? And the good news is that distilleries and brands who pay attention to these things have responded in kind. A few weeks ago, we had the lads on from um, Two Stacks who've released, I think, mm-hmm. the highest ABV whiskey uh, that is that is on the market right now at 65%, um, which would take the paint off your walls if you wanted to. But, but it's a fantastic whiskey and, and, and a great one to experience the different flavor profiles at that strength. Yeah. My um, bottle's about 20% gone already. <laughs> isn't it great? So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I bought it right away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's also some issues with taxation in Ireland, which of course, yeah. as, as you go excise duty, as you go up that, that for that, that percentage ABV, it adds quite a lot to the bottle, doesn't it? Um, well, great. that's, a, that's, a, that's another thing that I suppose I'm probably <laughs> fairly well known for being, being vocal about is, um, you know, we get absolutely hammered in Ireland as it, as it applies to excise duty. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Um, we have the highest, uh, excise duty in the EU for wine. We have the third highest excise duty in the EU for spirits. Um, we have in and around the highest uh, excise for, for beer. I'd say it probably is the highest for cider. So we're, we get absolutely hammered on it. If, if you look at a bottle of whiskey that's um, 40% ABV, 700 mils, um, off the top of my head, I can't remember the exact figure, but it's something around 1140, um, 11 euros 40 per bottle, just the, just an excise duty alone, you know? And <laughs> what's even worse is <laughs> that's before the VAT gets added. So we've got this, right. you know, VAT rate, which which for people in the U.S. is kind of like our sales tax. Um, but instead of the 6% that it is in Michigan, it's 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 23% here. And the excise duty itself um, actually attracts VAT at 23%. So you're paying a tax on the excise tax. So, and as the, a, as the ABV goes up, um, that, that excise duty increases pro rata because it's calculated based on liters of pure alcohol. So if you've got a if you've got a bottle that's um, 60% ABV, it's gonna the excise tax is gonna be 50% higher than if you have 40% ABV. So um, from a retail price perspective, it it jumps up significantly really really it quickly. It's an absolute joke, really. I mean, it, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's it's a travesty prohibited. that it, that it's so high. And you know, I think the problem is that politically here you know if you start you know you start calling for a reduction in excise duty you get all the uh the nanny staters jumping on board um that's right trying to say that the cheap alcohol is a problem in ireland but you know i don't think it's possible for cheap alcohol to be a problem if you don't actually have (laughs) cheap alcohol alcohol. to begin with (laughs) and i think the answer is not to is not to boycott distilleries or whiskey brands because of the price but rather to vote and to harass in the best in the most polite way in the most legal way your elected representatives to make them yeah. aware that this is a problem look ireland has had a long history of, of dangers and challenges with alcohol and i've no doubt that part of the taxation is due to is is partly due to trying to discourage overconsumption. um mm. and it is a it's a it's a tricky tightrope to navigate and to walk i've no doubt it is. And, you know, I guess the, the thing of it is, um, if you if you do accept that there may be an issue with alcohol in, in Ireland, which, you know, certainly in, in, in some quarters there is, um, if taxation were the answer, then you'd certainly think that the problem would be less than it is, given that we have the third highest excise in, in the EU. Um, so it, it would seem to me that that hasn't that hasn't worked. Um, and right. and. I, I don't see that increasing it more would work any better. I don't see that decreasing it um, would would make the problem significantly worse. Um, I, I do think that decreasing it would put higher quality products into into people's hands, which is, you know, certainly what um, what my priority would be anyway. Well, let me ask you this: I'm over here in the United States. I'm an Irishman in America. You're an American in Ireland. I can't run for the highest office in the land in America because I wasn't born here. Can you run for the highest office in Ireland to uh, to fight this battle on behalf of whiskey drinkers? I have absolutely no interest in running for any political office whatsoever. I've probably probably made too many controversial comments on Twitter that would get that would get dragged out into the open, and I'd probably lose. With me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd lose before the campaign even started. So. <laughs> Well, if you do start a protest, we'll give you a platform here to, to wave your banners and your placards around. Very um, good. <laughs> but the good news is that the three whiskeys we're tasting tonight, none of them are at 40% ABV. And when we, we talked during the week, we were both looking through what we had on our shelves to see what we had that mm-hmm. would match. And we chose three whiskeys that it was only in retrospect, right? When, when, when I hung up the phone, I looked at the ABV and I realized, actually, we didn't pick any of them based on their, on their ABV. We picked them based on the flavor profiles and the stories we could tell. 
But mm -hmm. the first one we're going to try Rath Eden. That's bottled yeah. at fifty percent from Waterford from Waterford whiskey. Um, that's right. Yeah. So why don't we start? Let's. There's no point <clears> of us <throat> talking and not wetting our wetting our lips with a drop of whiskey. I I know that you're a fierce defender of Waterford Distillery and a, and a am, supporter yeah. of everything they do. Why do you like Waterford? Well, I think um, I think for me, having come from the wine business before I got serious about whiskey certainly helps with that. The whole concept of, um, of terroir is something that makes a lot of sense to me. It's something that I have understood for a long time. It's something that I've kind of often wished that we would see highlighted in other products that I'm into. Um, so it's something that I've always thought would be great to see, great to see in whiskey. Um, it exists in some other spirits, the, the concept or the acceptance of the concept, like cognac, for example, where you have um, the, the terroirs are, are legally defined by the, the French Department of Agriculture. Um, so, you know, for me, I thought that um, when I when I learned about the project that they're working on to, to highlight the, uh, the terroir of barley, um, given that I'd spent so much time learning about the terroir of grapes and how that translates into wine, it was um, a very easy jump for me intellectually. And it already spoke to uh, an area of interest that I have and kind of, I guess, work to combine my interests in wine along with my interest in, in whiskey. Um, you know, I guess within the whiskey community, the concept of terroir is a little bit controversial, but um, when, when I talk to wine people about it, um, they, it, it doesn't seem to be as controversial in, in those circles. So I think, I guess that might be why I was positively predisposed right. to, the, to the notion from, from the beginning. Um, and I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a fascinating amount of, um, of fun and exploration that we have ahead of us with this whole thing. So I think, um, I think it's just, I just think it's really exciting. So you've got the lovely blue bottle there. I have this sample bottle. I've not been lucky enough to get a full size bottle yet. But you, you not only managed to get your hands on all of the water that's been released, but you've opened them all as well, haven't you? Um, I, I, there's one I haven't opened very. It's the, uh, it's the, the, the pilgrimage. Um, oh yes, that one, that one remains, remains sealed. But yes, the rest I've got all of the, um, I've got all the single farm origins. I do have them all open. I've got backups of all of them not open as well. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I have enjoyed tasting my way through them, and uh, I think. Um, we had you Ned on here a few weeks ago. We had Ned, Ned on, the head distiller, Ned Gahan from Waterford Distillery was on here a few weeks ago. He walked us through, he walked me through the samples that I had and mixing them together. And he was, he was great crack all together. And people enjoyed that, the, the yeah. crack with Ned and learning about Waterford. For those of you who are in the United States, stay tuned because I'm going to have news in the next few days about the whiskeys that are available in the United States. In fact, I'm going to have samples of all the U.S. releases uh, in the next few days that I can share and talk about where they're going to be available from. So stay tuned. We're going to try to do something special for you in the United States as well through our Facebook group on that. Um, so we've talked to Ned about Waterford Whiskey, um, David. I also wanted to talk to you about nosing and tasting and appreciating whiskey. This first whiskey that we're going to taste tonight, Rath Eden, is a great yeah. start for us to, to talk about nosing and understanding whiskey. So from yeah. your wine background and from your, your spirits and whiskey enthusiasm, what, what should we be looking for and what should we be thinking about when we're when we're first nosing a whiskey for the first time? Well, I think the first key thing is is, is you want to make sure that you have um, appropriate glassware, right? And there's a number of a number of ways that might look. You know, you've got your classic Glencairn glass, if you can see that. This is the Riedel Old Cognac glass, which I really like. It's similar to the Glencairn in shape, but it's more delicate. We've got the, the Tua glass here. Um, from Rosie, which is absolutely beautiful. It's one of my favorite glasses. This is a glass I got from the Bimber Distillery in, in London. But you can see that the, the kind of common thing between them all is that there's a there's a bowl that holds the whiskey and then it kind of gets narrow at the top so that you're able to, to isolate the aromas. Um, what I do, and I guess, you know, there's a number of ways that, that, that people do this. The mechanics of it is fairly simple. Um, I try not to, you know, if, I, if I'm drinking wine, I'm going to do a big swirl in the glass to really get the the aromas um uh coming out of the coming out of the wine and filling into the glass but with whiskey there's so much more alcohol you end up just getting like a big burn so what i try to do is just a kind of a slow roll around the glass to it it's it still kind of releases some aromas but there's not so much alcohol that's been been uh evaporated into the glass that it that it burns your nose and a, a technique that um 
that I learned off a buddy of mine actually back in back in Michigan. I don't know if if um, if, if Darsh is watching, um, but if he's not now, he'll probably watch on the replay. Um, when you when you inhale the whiskey with your nose, what I like to do is a um, kind of a, a deep but very slow inhale. You know, if you really kind of get your nose in there and a big sniff, you don't you don't get an awful lot of a subtlety there. But a, a long slow inhale. And and what he taught me to do was if you and I don't do this with wine, but I do it with whiskey now. Is if you just if you open your mouth when you do it. You know, it, it, you really get an awful lot more aroma, which I I can't understand exactly how that works or why it works. But, you know, I've shown it, that technique to a bunch of people. You know, you smell it with your mouth closed and then you smell it with your mouth open. And there's just so much more. It must have something to do with how your jaw opens up your nasal cavity or something. But I, I really find that 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 helps. So in terms of nosing a whiskey, that's that's what I do. Um, you know, I think where people where people tend to struggle a little bit is in identifying the aromas that they're, that they're smelling. Um, and I think, you know, where, where the best advice I have for somebody in, in that sense is to, you know, within the rest of your life, really pay attention to the way things smell and the way things taste. Um, and in order to do that, you need to, you need to try a whole, a whole lot of different things, you know, so you might be smelling a whiskey and, and you might be smelling, um, I don't know, fenugreek seeds, you might be smelling cardamom seeds, you might be smelling any different number of types of flowers or even even meat or, you know, gaminess or anything like this. So, you know, if you're if your entire diet is, you know, Doritos, barbecue sauce, frozen pizza and Taco Bell, all of which are things I love. Um, but Very if that's your entire, <laughs> yeah. Very but if, 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 if that's your entire diet, then, you know, it's going to be difficult for you to have a, a large enough, say, vocabulary. Um, to be able to find these different different aromas and things. Um, That's a so, great point. Yeah. I, I want to jump in on that, Dave, because you you mentioned something to me years ago when we I first started chatting with you on Twitter, and you you shared how there's a there's some of you may be familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk. He's a, a bit of a celebrity in the wine world. His family had a wine store in New Jersey for many years, still do, and he started Wine Library TV. And he had a great video where he talked about how to understand the flavors and those the profile of of wine. He said. You've just got to taste everything. And he filled his desk up with every kind of food, chips, fruits, vegetables. And he said, if you don't know what they taste like, you'll never be able to identify them in your glass. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, I mean, um, you know, and and that's probably something that's easier for me because um, I was, you know, I was brought up as a kid to have a, a, a varied diet to try different things. My dad got me into cooking at a very young age. Um, so I think that... Um, that certainly helped me, you know, and, you know, in, in the wine world, there's an awful lot of that. People spend an awful lot of time um, trying to hone their skills around that sort of thing. So um, for me, transitioning that to whiskey was 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 pretty easy. Um, but I think the key thing is to try to um, expand your aroma vocabulary and your flavor vocabulary as much as possible by trying as many different things as you can and really paying attention to, to what things smell and taste like. You know, I'll give you an example, right? So, you know, a lot of times, um, if you're smelling a very mature red wine, you'll get this kind of meaty gaminess, which, you know, I kind of liken to walking into a butcher shop in Ireland. You get that, that, that meaty smell when you walk into a butcher shop. But if you've never walked into a butcher shop and paid attention to what that smelled like, um, it's not going to make much sense if I tell you that that's what it smells like. But at the same time, you're, you're not going to be able to identify that. Barry, I know you've been into butcher shops in Ireland. And I know you know the exact smell I'm talking about. Um, Sawdust on the but, floor, meat hanging from the ceiling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But but you know, growing up in in suburban Detroit, you know, I didn't know what a butcher shop was. It was just going to the supermarket and grabbing my meat in a in a packet. But you know, just from having gone in there and paid attention to that smell, and it's just something that kind of stuck into my head. Um, it, it's just another thing that I can refer back to. Uh, so I, I yeah. think that's yeah. a, a really good thing for people to spend some time at. So what when you when you knows Waterford, Rath Eden, which is a single malt, just over three years old, single mm. farm. Race. What do you get on the nose when you? Well, so what you know, Waterford talks about their their spirit being very barley forward, which it definitely is. Um, I think it's quite floral and fruity. There's there's kind of some 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 honeysuckle. Um, if anyone's a home brewer, if they've ever brewed beer, you might know what liquid malt extract is. I kind of get that kind of liquid malt extract type of smell. 
And then along with the honey, it almost becomes like a like a honey nut Cheerio. <laughs> I like a honey nut Cheerio type yeah, of aroma. Yeah, I get that. You know, there's certainly I, I, a, a sweetness there. Whenever I hear, I, I love listening to people tell me what they get from the whiskeys because I have such a, I consider myself to have a very amateur nose and palate. And so I'm always trying to understand what are others getting and can I detect the same thing? And sometimes you'll find a note that somebody says, you'll never forget it. You'll get it instantly. Um, so I'm always curious, yeah. you know, what, what different people get. And I think um, it must, I think it was Taylor Cope from, from Malt Review. Uh, tasted this and he said that he got kind of a, a wine like a, a a wine grapes type of thing which I kind of agree with as well um, you know kind of like a white burgundy along with some of the oak yeah. that can come through with that um, not a super mineral white burgundy like a Chablis but something a bit more decadent like a Pouligny Marche or a Merceau or something which um, which is really nice so there's you know given that this is a very young whiskey I'm I'm getting quite a lot of complexity out of this. There's there's a yeah, lot going yeah. on from an from an own perspective. I'm I'm sure you'd agree. What what are you what are you getting? Yeah, I get that. I get that honey absolutely. There's a biscuitiness that comes through for me on the nose. Um, when you said honey nut Cheerios, I can taste those in my mouth before I've tasted a drop of this whiskey instantly. That coating on the on the Cheerio, mm. that little glisten, mm. I get that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When you mentioned yeah. wine, like you you mentioned. Maybe it is, or maybe it isn't Chablis. I tend to think of whiskey and colors for some reason. I think there's a name for that. I don't know what it is, but I, I picture tastes in color. And so I think of this as green, as white, and crisp. And it, there's a crispness okay. to it, um, which, mm -hmm. which uh, f for its age, it's not, there's no harshness on the nose. No, there really isn't. There really isn't. It's, it's, it's quite rounded. They use a bunch of different cast types in this, which I'm, which I'm guess is, guessing is going to kind of help that. But that having right. been said, I've take, tasted a couple of their new makes at over seventy percent ABV, and and even and even those um, don't have necessarily the harshness that you might expect with a, with a new make or even one at that high of an ABV. And I've given them to a lot of people that don't drink a lot of stuff like that, and they've and they've agreed. So um, yeah, I think there's um, certainly a lot of complexity here. Very good quality spirit, which helps at, at such a young age. So should should we taste it? And how should we taste? So what I do is I try not to take too big of a sip because again, in the, the, there's quite a lot of alcohol there. So if you take too big of a gulp, you're just going to just get a burn. But what I try to do when I take a sip, is just let the whiskey kind of roll across the palate. And then the other thing I try to do is make a, make a chewing motion. Um, something that someone taught me in the, in the wine world is apart from moving the, the liquid around your mouth and coating all the flavor receptors in your mouth, um, you're kind of tricking your brain into, into thinking that you're eating food. Mm. And I think, you know, in the, in the cultures that we're brought up in, um, you know, we do a lot more thinking about flavor and texture when we're eating mm. than when we're drinking something. So I think, um, you know, just that motion kind of tricks your brain into thinking that it's that, that it's eating something and probably subliminally um, makes it a bit more receptive to um, appreciating nuance and then kind of uncovering some of this stuff. I don't know how true it is, but it, it made sense to me when it was talking. Like so I've never heard that. So before. I do that. Yeah. 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 I like that. Um, somebody said to me once, I, I mean, you know, look, growing up in, in the United States, shooting whiskey is uh, is quite commonplace and I, I, I hadn't seen anybody shoot a whiskey in Ireland until I, at all. Until, and for my first time seeing people shoot whiskey was over here in the United States. In Ireland, we, mm. we sip it. And I'm always yeah. trying to encourage Americans to start with a little sip if you want to shoot it later, by all means. But like start with a little sip to get the flavor profiles. But you mentioned you just take yeah. a small little sip. How long do you leave it in your mouth? Is there, is there any um, rule to that? Um. I don't know if I leave it in my mouth as long as some others do. Um, you know, I, I, I don't leave it in my mouth as long as I would wine. Um, a, a few seconds, you know, I mean, I guess I just let it, you know, um, kind of roll across the palate, uh, you know, a few chews. And within maybe three or four seconds, I guess it's I guess it's gone. Um, yeah, I have seen people uh, do things a bit longer and start doing all the swishing stuff. For me, I think the alcohol can get a little bit intense if I do that, so I I, I don't really do it. Um, that's just, but you know, that's just my technique that that works yeah. for me. I think you know the important thing 
isn't the technique that somebody uses. I think the important thing is, um, you know, being receptive to the different flavors, trying to isolate them or describe them uh, and identify them. Um, you know, whether you're able to communicate that to somebody else is, is, is another thing that's actually quite difficult to kind of say, I pick out this flavor and this flavor and this flavor and to pick those out and, and be able to explain that to someone else in a way that's going to be meaningful to them that's quite a challenge, but, you know, luckily it's not that important for people to be able to do that unless you're, you know, unless you're a, a, a reviewer or a critic. I think the important thing is to be able to think about it in terms that, that relate to yourself. And if, if, if that helps you to, to appreciate it more, right. all the better. Yeah. People, uh, people can get very academic with whiskey tasting and it kind of turns me off sometimes when people get super, super technical about it. Uh, and look, there's a place for all of that in, in any aspect of life. But mm. one of the things that gets over often overlooked is the question, did you like it? Did you enjoy it? Yeah. And yeah. if so, yeah. what did you enjoy? What did you like? Because I, when I started sipping on whiskey, I was very intimidated. And when I started tasting whiskey, very intimidated by what I was hearing online and, and from the community that had spent a long, long time experimenting with whiskey of what they were getting and how they were getting it. I thought, I'm not getting any of that, but I like it. And yeah. I don't know why um, so we need we we need space, don't we, to to enjoy it? Yeah, I mean it's um it's it can be a bit contradictory, right? I think if 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 I'm teaching someone how to, I, I used to teach a lot of wine courses when I was in the in the wine business. I um, was in charge of our wine education program, and we'd bring people in for um, courses. They were either one night courses or they might last three weeks. Um, and one of the things that I tried to do at the beginning is is to convince people to for now, forget about whether you like it or not. Um, because if you if you release your kind of preconceived notions about what you like and what you don't like, and you just think about what is it that you're tasting? Is the taste intense? Is it not that intense? Is it subtle? Is it complex? Is it singular? Or are you getting a bunch of different things? Can you identify them or not? And think about it in a more uh, analytical way. I think can what, what I've seen is that helps people to kind of expand what they like and start to understand, oh, well, this is something that I thought that I didn't like so much, but now that I've taken time to consider it and identify yes. what, what the overall experience is made of, um, turns out I like this thing that I didn't previously think that I would enjoy. Um, so it, it kind of goes both ways. Absolutely, the important thing is to enjoy it and the important thing is to have fun. Yeah. Um, but if you want to put, if you, if, if you put in, if you want to put in time to, to expand your palate and have a deeper understanding, then there's also an argument for maybe letting go of some of the um, the preconceived uh, preconceived ideas that you have. So there's a there's yes. a, there's a space for there's a space for both really. You know, and I think that's the that's the key thing. It, there's there's certainly scope for 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 snobbery in terms of um, you know getting really technical with all these different flavors and stuff like that, and it can be off putting. At the same time, you know, there's there's there can be an element of, of reverse snobbery as well. Um, where people yes. say, oh, well, you know, all that's, that's just all bullshit that you're talking there and it's, and, and yeah. it's not, I think there's, there's a place for both. So there's, um, you raised an interesting point about pre preconceived notions. There's two of our three whiskeys tonight are younger than four years old. They're three and a bit years old, this one and the W.D. O'Connell Bill Phil, and then we're yeah. drinking a five year old powers. What's interesting about that is that there's a, there are some preconceived notions that the older a whiskey, the better. And I think that can be the case. In other cases, it may not be the case, but it's one example, isn't it, of where a preconceived notion might prevent you from tasting or ever spending money on trying something that you could have liked, but you never gave it the chance. That's an that's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. And you know, I've seen I've seen people talk about the the, the price of a release of a young whiskey, and you might like, for example, the, this this Waterford I think was seventy five euros, and I've you know heard people say, well, that's that's too much for a three year old whiskey. Um, the, the way I look at it is the fact that it's a three-year-old whiskey isn't the important part. The, 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 the important part is what's the ex experience that it delivers. And is that experience worth 75 euros to be able to have 19 and a half times, uh, and, and which is the number of Irish measures that you get in a, in a 70 CL bottle. And for me, absolutely it is, um, yeah. you know, age be damned in some ways, you know, now yeah, that being yeah. said, you know, I love my I love my old whiskeys as well. You know, the know. The, the, the Redbreast 27 is is absolutely fantastic. Um, 
and, and you, pay, you pay dearly for that as well. But <laughs> you do, you do. But it, it's so subjective, and I, I hope nobody ever gets discouraged from trying whiskies because somebody said something to put them off trying it because of a preconceived notion. And and I think yeah. whiskey enjoyment is so subjective. And one of the examples I'm I'm always reminded of when it comes to whiskey is like my wife and I, we, we live in a city. So we live in a small, tiny little apartment in a city as many people do in cities. And if I talk to somebody who comes from the countryside or comes from let's say Iowa, as opposed to a city in California, and I tell them, here's what I'm paying for my rent. They'll say, well, you could get a seven bedroom house in Iowa <laughs> for the same price. So they say, but that's not what we value. That's not what yeah. we're looking for. We want to live in the city, you know? Uh, yeah, but yeah. not about number of bedrooms. And it's just like, it's not, it's not the number of years on the bottle either, is it? No, I mean, it, it can certainly help. You know, it can certainly help. And, uh, you know, in, in the case of the in the case of the Waterford, as is the case of the, the Bill Phil, I'm sure that, um, you know, as the years progress and, and stock matures, um, you know, they'll, they'll deliver even more. But I think that, um, you know, anyone who's going to drink either of these two whiskeys is not going to be left um, left wanting for, for complexity no. and no. and a, a very pleasurable drink experience in, no, in, in no. my mind. And they're not the only ones as well. I mean, like there's other young whiskeys in Ireland that are fantastic as well. Like Dingle's not that old yet. Um, the Batch 5 single malt is is absolutely delicious. Uh, so shout out mm -hmm. to, to Graham. I think that was the first release that, that that he put together after coming down. But there's the, um, what's the other peated one? I know you don't like those as much, but the, uh, oh, from the, the Donegal one from Sleeve League, the, uh, the, the Silky. Dark, silky Silky. Dark. Yeah, yep. that's that's three years in a bit, I think, and it's it's just absolutely fantastic. Uh, and another one that you'd never know was 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 that young. So there's a few, um, and 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 you know the, the, these are whiskeys that I give to people. Um, yeah, some of them know about whiskey, some of them don't know that much about whiskey, and I've never had anyone come back on any of those and say that's just too harsh or too. You know too, what we're doing, David? We're we're breaking down barriers here. Yeah, we're letting yeah. we're telling people there's no barriers, there's no walls, there's just bridges between whiskeys. It's a exactly <laughs> yeah, and, bridge and, from and one uh, maybe a, maybe I'll burn a few of them on Twitter at the odd time, but uh, you're right. And so <laughs> it's all right. We've got you on a five second delay here in case you try and burn a few bridges. <laughs> very good. Yeah. So look, let's let's move on to the next whiskey because the next one is very different altogether. So we, you you've lined up these in order that you wanted to talk about them and for us to experience them. The next one mm. we're going to taste is Powers John's Lane, a staple in every Irish whiskey lover's. Oh, look, your bottle looks like mine, almost empty. You know, I, you know, I was, it's funny enough, I was, I was actually thinking about that when we decided we were gonna drink it. I was like, man, I, I won't be able to have any of this before the, before the show because I won't have any left. And when I saw yours was similarly uh, nearly yeah. empty like mine is, you know, it really gave me pause for thought in that um, I don't have a backup of this bottle and I started to think, man, why don't I have a backup of this bottle? It's so good. And then I realized I don't have a backup of it because I don't need to. Like you can get this absolutely everywhere. You can, which is amazing. There's no, there, there's no place in Ireland where you're more than two miles from a bottle of Powers John's Lane, and it's like, it's absolutely fantastic that you can that you can get it anywhere you go. Um, excuse me, it's not an inexpensive whiskey, but it's not. Excuse me, it's not ridiculously priced either. Um, so I don't need to stockpile it because there's no danger that, you know, if I go out to get some next week that I won't be able to put my hand on any number of bottles. So do you uh, choose, which is brilliant. Do you choose where you live based on your proximity to Powers John's Lane? Is it, is the house within two miles of a Powers John's Lane? Well, I, I don't think you're ever more than about two miles from a bottle of Powers John's Lane, no matter where you are in Ireland. So that would be it's like in, in, open. <laughs> in New York, you're never more than five feet from a rat. In Ireland, you're never more than <laughs> two miles from Powers John's Lane. <laughs> Maybe you could say the, uh, that, uh, the other thing about Ireland as well sometimes, I'm not sure, but the different kinds of rats. <laughs> and I'm only totally. joking. <laughs> All right, five seconds away. <laughs> yeah. So we're moving down in ABV here. We're going up in years and we're going down in ABV. 12 years, John's Lane, which for those of you uh, who are not familiar with ABV <coughs> whiskey, that is the youngest component whiskey within that bottle. There may be 13 or 14 year old whiskey in there, perhaps, but the youngest by law has to be declared on the bottle. And the ABV of Powers John's Lane is 46% or 92 proof for our American friends. So I think, you know, just just immediately on the nose, this is obviously completely different uh, from the Waterford um, for a number of reasons. One, what the Waterford's a single malt, the, the John's Lane's a single pot still. I'm assuming that people watching know the difference between single malt and single pot still. Um, 
but you're certainly going to get a little bit of extra spice out of that. Um, there's Let's talk about that. Real obvious quick. Wait, will we, will we a quick pr primer on the difference? So the first one we had was a single malt. Um, yeah. Or for so, a sing, uh, yeah, so a single malt being that the, the mash bill is made of 100% malted barley, whereas with the single pot still, and now the thing is there's a lot of people in the Irish whiskey community that know a hell of a lot more than I do about the uh, specificities of um, mash bills in, in, in the pot still category. But, um, you know, what I can say is that at the very least, it's a, it's a mix of malted and unmalted barley. Um, and that unmalted barley element is going to give you uh, some more spice. Um, not the same type of spice that you're going to get from your, the spice that you get from an American rye, but it will be spice, a spice nonetheless, more of a pepperiness than the kind of gingerbread that you get off a of rye. Um, uh, but it is, it is very good and it can lend some, some, some nice complexity. I think so the, 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 the thing with the John's Lane is, is, you know, given it's 12 years, there's a bit of, there's a bit of sherry cask in this it's bourbon and sherry as far as i know and it's this light pot still and mm -hmm. middleton do a number of different styles of pot still and i understand that the powers is the, is the light pot still which is gonna um gonna lend itself uh i guess to some some lighter more more floral uh and and fragrant delicate type of aromas when i put my nose in certainly it, has. Like, i get more alcohol on the nose on this than i did on the waterford and maybe it's not alcohol i'm getting but there's this nail varnishy nose to me on on john's lane all the time what, what is that that i'm getting i think that's coming from the coming from the sherry the sherry i get but i i, I get a similar thing on the the green spot 26 year as well um so but maybe it's from the maybe it's from the pot still distillate personally i think it's 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 part of the sherry thing okay but it's definitely there and not in a bad way you know, it's kind of one of those things like, you know, you, you smell something like that and you identify it as nail varnish and it sounds, sounds horrible, but <laughs> it's kind of in the same way. Like if you're, if you, if you walk behind a, a lawnmower and you can smell that, smell the gasoline burning, it actually, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of attractive. So I think it's, I think it's fantastic. I get quite a lot of fruits out of this kind of these like red brambly fruits, like red currants and kind of stewed rhubarb. A little bit more subtle almost than the waterford um on the nose for me. yeah it is it is more subtle um it doesn't jump out quite as much but there's yeah. an awful lot of complexity there's an awful lot going on um i get hints of like kind of potpourri kind of cigar tobacco right yeah i get the tobacco so there's quite a lot happening completely different types of aromas than what you're getting from the from the waterford kind of deeper mm -hmm. more kind of tertiary kind of mature aromas that are coming from the probably from the sherry and from the fact that it is a bit a bit older that's spice instant spice instant instantly compared to the single malt a little effervescence from the spice on the tongue yeah there's like a kind of a um white pepper or even like pink peppercorn mm. um type of type of type of thing going on more from a texture perspective than even from the flavor perspective there's definitely like a, a little peak there which is um which is something that i find i get a lot with 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 the the middleton pot stills i don't know if anybody else does but it's certainly um certainly how i interpret it did, did you have any knowledge of irish whiskey before leaving the united states um some so I came to Ireland on holiday in 1998, uh, visited someone who was living in Derry and went to the Bushmills distillery in 1998. And that was really my first, um, my first encounter with Irish whiskey was, was at the Bushmills distillery. And so I was always a fan of, of those Bushmills malts, you know, particularly, I think the, um, the 16 year old, um, but it wasn't until after I actually moved here that I discovered Redbreast in probably Falls Pub in Ennis, which um, JJ Corey fans will will be familiar with. Great Falls Pub in Ennis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's probably there that I discovered that, and um, you know that kind of started to to broaden my horizons a little bit. Once you find Red, I always think that there's when you first discovered Redbreast, your life then gets divided into before Redbreast and after Redbreast. Oh, you're right, man. I mean, for me, I think it's it's really tough to beat red breast it, it it really is you know and, and especially the 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 cash strength versions or the 
the single casks that you get, like those single cask red breasts. I mean, if 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 those were the only whiskeys you drank for the rest of your life, it'd be a pretty be good okay. life. I gotta say, yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, you're That's a big fortified wine. Be. Actually, like you love sherry contribution, you love port wine contribution, Madeira, Marsala. That's your jam, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I have a bit of a sweet tooth when it comes to when it comes to that. So, um, you know, that's why I really like the Green Spot Twenty Six Year. I know our our friend um, Phil at Malt Review and and Causeway Coast Reviews doesn't really care for that one, but I think it's fantastic, He's and I like the. Um, what's that? He's dead to us. He's dead to us. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I I think that's fantastic. I like for me. I really like the decadent the decadence of, of those whiskeys and the the hedonism of those. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of debate around which of those red breast casks is the best one. I think a lot of people have settled in on the friend at hand one, the 25 year from the, the pub of Belfast, which is fantastic. Personally, I prefer the palace bar one, um, which is younger, but I think it's maybe a little less complex than the friend at hand, but it's more decadent. Um, it's got more of that, um, kind of sticky toffee pudding, sticky toffee pudding, uh, aspect going on, which, which personally really, really speaks to me. So I do like, I do like a lot of that. Yeah. Those single cask releases, which here in the United States, we don't see them um, at all. Those are way up there, both in terms of price, but also perhaps on your whiskey journey. It's Those are things you work your way up to. Where does John's Lane sit for somebody who's just getting into Irish whiskey, do you think? Uh, at what point do you recommend now is the time to get to John's Lane? Right away, I think. Um, it's, they I think it's super. I, I, well, I mean, I think it's super accessible. Maybe day one, start off with like a Powers Gold label or the Three Swallows um, because it's good to, to kind of work your way up a little bit. The great thing about Three Swallows in the U.S. is that it's 43%, not 40% like it is here. Um, so so I can highly recommend it. And if you're in the U.S., get a bottle of Three Swallows. Even at 40%, it's good. Um, but, you know, I think that extra extra few points would, would, would make a big difference. So um that's a great way to start the gold label is a great way to start i think that might even be 43 percent in the u.s as well um, it is yeah. even though yeah. it's only 40 here um so you know grab grab a hold of that stuff for sure and you know once you kind of equate yourself with those um get into the john's lane it's it's you know fairly accessible from a price perspective um and i think it, it just got such complexity it's got so much to offer and i think the great thing about the john's lane I can't remember was I saying it online recently or to someone that is the type of whiskey that you know it's accessible enough and you can get it anywhere which means that if you just want to sit back and drink it casually while you're you know just talking with some friends you can do that and deliver a perfectly pleasurable experience and kind of guilt-free because you're not feeling like you're drinking something that's so rare that you can't replace and then at the same time if you do want to sit down and you know really know something and get into the glass and spend some time with it it'll reward you in in, in that way as well so I think it um it, 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 it really hits a sweet spot in, in terms of its its versatility. I agree um, with that. It's definitely something that if you're into Irish whiskey at all, or really any kind of whiskey, I think, you know, it's something that you should have on the bar. Really. If, if you're alive and breathing, you should have Powers John's name in your bar. And, and otherwise, yeah. you don't have to. Um, Johnny has yeah. a good a good point there. John's Lane is not very expensive. It's not for the price. And, and we were talking earlier, David, about excise duty in Ireland and the yeah. cost, the taxes in Ireland. Of course, we can get... Irish whiskeys from Middleton anywhere in America cheaper than you can get them in the distillery shop in Middleton, which does make these whiskeys much more affordable in the United States. Sorry, Irish Irish whiskey fans, but uh, yeah, we get them cheaper over here. You could do without rubbing that in, Barry. I know. I've got to keep rubbing that in. You get you get a bigger selection. We get it pisses me off to no end. I got to tell you, you know, when I go on the the German websites and the John's Lane is like thirty eight ninety five, and it's and it's sixty five here, you know. Uh, it is, it's is purely the tax, but you know, I, I suppose at some point you have to kind of just let that go and, and it is what it is. And, um, it is. you know, it's you, all, it's all, it's all kind of relative, I guess. But you look, you, you have two passports. You could live anywhere or do you have two passports? You could, you could, you live in, you could live in America anyway, cause you were born in America. Yeah. So yeah. Want, yeah, yeah. And I'm working on the, I'm working on the Irish one. So yeah, <laughs> I'm working on the Irish. Um, a question for you on the cask strength side of things. The, so the, the first one, the Rath Eden that we tried yeah they're very open and watered with their data their information their sharing and on every label and on the, the the website where you can put in the code from your bottle you'll get the details of the bottle yeah, so just to, just to show people they have this yeah. terroir code on the back there it is which is here yeah and you go into the waterford website you type that in 
and the amount of information that's there is just ridiculous. The days it was distilled on, the individual cast that make up the blend, how long, how many liters were in that cask, where it came from, if it's a French wine cask, like, uh, I think it might even say the, the, the chateau that it came from, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's got the what coopers each barrel came from. Um, it's just an in, in, insane amount of information. It really is. So one more of, than, one of the data more than you could ever, ever, ever even ask for. Or sometimes oh, I know. I mean, there, there's even a sound cloud of the sound of the fields, the barley blowing in the wind, the, the birds. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yeah. The wind. Yeah. If that's your yeah. thing, close your eyes, open a bottle, and just play the sound cloud of that whiskey. But there's one data point I wanted to share with you, and that's the the cask ABV. So the the ABV that it went uh, or that it came out of the cask at. Um, mm -hmm. Which was seven, or, or wait, is that what it went in at? Cask ABV seventy one point one eight. Would that it have gone like in? It? it sounds like the entry point. Yeah, entry yeah. point. Yeah, because their new make it, is generally between seventy and seventy two. I think depending on the on the farm. And then it was sampled at fifty percent, or it was bottled at fifty percent. So yeah. when you're on this cask strength crusade, you're not just saying, "Look, whatever is the cask strength at the." end of maturation just bottle it are you or, or are you saying just don't be 40 percent both <laughs> i mean i'd love to see it I'd, I'd love to see it at cash strength because um you know if it's not bottled at cash strength then i'll never know what it tastes like at cash strength and right. i might I, you know there might be a particular but look at the red breast 12 year cash strength i almost never um i almost never put water in that because i think it's just great mm -hmm. straight out of the bottle if I look at some other cash drink bottles I have, for example, the two stacks, I put a bit of water in that. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I put, you know, I've got the Dunville's 18 Palo Cortado. That's their cash drink is like around 55 or so. Um, I put a little bit of water in that. Um, but if it's yeah. not bottled at cash drink, then I don't have the opportunity to to know what it was like at cash drink. So yeah. I've yeah. said to the guys in Waterford, I'd, I'd love for you guys to bottle something at cash drink. And they said, well, they yeah, but it'd be like 69%. And I said, dude, I'm, I'm cool with that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind. Yeah, um, but but uh, but on the same token, um, you know, there are commercial realities at play and stuff like that. Um, but definitely don't do, definitely don't do 40. Don't go, don't, you don't want to start out at the minimum. I, I agree with you. Know? you. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, can we rub in? Can we rub it into you a little bit more about the American side of things? We also get fifty milliliters extra per bottle uh, than you do, uh, and for thanks. and for less money. Why thanks, did you? Make, <laughs> thanks for reminding me of that as well. Yeah, it's they like have to be an extra free measure. You know, you buy the bottle and it's like, and here's one for yourself. You know, free measure. <laughs> but don't give out yeah, to Larry. Larry's a, Larry's, Larry's a great guy. Larry's a great guy. I I, I have a lot of um, conversation with Larry. He's a um, a fellow JJ Corey collector. Um, he is, and Larry's and, helping us with the story. He is, yeah, yeah. He told he told me about that, which is which is fantastic. No better man to be be working on that side of things. He's got he's got a quite an operation there in in, in California to help out with stuff like that. So that's uh, that's brilliant. Yeah, great, great guy though, really really great guy. He's he's got a few um, bottles of bourbon over to me here in in Ireland that I was I was chasing after. So um, just a, a quick cheers to to Larry for helping me cheers out. Cheers, Larry. Some of those cheers, things. good guy. And David celebrating his bootlegging, his intercontinental bootlegging. <laughs> um, I know the, all, all highly, all highly tax compliant. Shit all like legal, all paid on all of it for sure. Yep, that's yep. Right. It's that's it, right. It's excruciating, but it's you know it's 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 the only way to get it here if you're not flying over and putting it in your luggage. So, if if you're just joining us, and I know a few people have joined uh, in the last few minutes. I'm here with David Mara. David Mara is what I would call a cask strength crusader, Irish whiskey super fan, an American man in Ireland in between County Clare and Donegal. That's some that's some drive. And he yeah. is here sampling whiskeys with us and helping us understand how he noses and tastes and appreciates and enjoys whiskey. And the lock-in is all about being locked in with interesting people who we don't mind spending time with. And we actually enjoy hanging out together. And David is one of those characters uh, and if you're enjoying the lock-in, uh, my only request is that you press share or retweet or you email a friend, but you let people know what we're doing here. So please uh, share the word about the lock-in because the more people that can join every week, well, the more fun we can have, the more great guests we can bring on, and also uh, the more people that are going to fall in love with Irish whiskey, and that's ultimately ultimately our goal. Um, I love Powers John's Lane uh, release. I love all three of the whiskeys that they have. Um, I'm... I'm disappointed that the range is so small in Powers, that there are only three whiskeys. When you think back, Powers, the one of the 
one of the best selling Irish whiskies in the world in its day, a behemoth of Irish whiskey in Dublin distilling back in the 1800s, late 1700s, mm -hmm. early 1800s, that they're down to just three whiskies and the number of cases they sell globally is, is, is a disappointment and a shame. And I'll do everything I can to help more people fall in love with powers. Like I grew up in a powers house. My mother had a bottle of gold label for the Irish coffees on a Sunday. And it's mm -hmm. just, it's, Americans aren't familiar with powers like Irish are, are they? No, I mean, it's certainly not something that I was familiar with at all before I came over here at all, at all. And uh, when I came over here, I started off uh, working in a, a pub in a hotel in Ennis and Clare. And, you know, Powers was um, just kind of sitting on the on the back shelf. Not an awful lot of discussion about it um, beyond the, the gold label. So I think there's definitely scope for enhancing the range. Um, there was some, I think, some talk on Twitter with Omar there yesterday that there was a um, a 21 year um, samples of a 21 year that were going around a couple of years ago, and that kind of seems to have disappeared a little bit. I think there's scope for an 18. I'd love to see an 18, uh, a Powers 18 year, which is 100% first fill bourbon. I think that would be fantastic. Mm. Um, you know, a little bit of extra ABV, of course, I'm going to say that, but something in around kind of 48, 50%, just to kind of crank it up a little bit. Um, especially with the bourbon cask, I think it would give it a nice, a nice punch. Um, so I, I definitely think there's scope for something like that. And of course, with the recent Belfast Whiskey Week Festival, which unfortunately I wasn't able to to, to get any of, but um, there was a Powers 12-year cask strength uh, sample that was going around in that, which by all accounts is absolutely unbelievable. Stunning. Um, our dear, our dear Phil and Malt Review said he preferred it to the um, to the Redbreast 12-year cask strength. I think so. Um, that's something that I would absolutely love to taste. Uh, I was actually at the um, Jameson Bow Street distillery with uh, with Jared Garland about a week or two ago, um, just after the 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 John Lane cash strength samples were were, were oh, tasted yeah. online. And I asked him about that. And I said, "Look, is there any any plans to release that? Because you know Twitter was going ballistic, saying this you have to release this, have to release it." And what he said was that actually the um, the brand manager, when they were putting together the what samples they were going to send out for this Belfast Whiskey Week thing, just said, well, let's do a John's Lane cash drink. And it was pretty much as off the cuff as that. And I don't think that it's something that they had considered as a release. But um, given the, the feedback that there is, uh, no Jer said, look, he goes, we're definitely pet petitioning those guys to, to, to make it happen. And I said, well, let's get it done. Let's get it done before Christmas. That'd it would be, be fantastic to be to be drinking that on uh, on, on, on Christmas evening after the after the turkey. It's, um, I, I had a taste of it. I really enjoyed it. Actually, I, have it. I think I have it here. Um, yeah, I have the Powers cask strength, John Zane cask strength here. I've taken a bit out of it, but I'm going to send on the remainder to a friend in Ireland who deserves it. The, um, I asked the brand manager for Powers in the United States this week about uh, plans for new releases of Powers, and sadly, she informed me that there's nothing, nothing in the pipeline currently that this year's mm -hmm. big. This year's big move is the rebranding, the relabeling, the re yep. rebottling of the of the brand and getting mm -hmm. uh, getting that out there. And actually, Which I like the new bottles, by the way. I got to say, I mean, there's been there's Same. been awful uproar over here about it, and I think people are maybe nostalgic about the the old bottle shape. But um, if you can kind of let that go and and look at the new bottles in a vacuum, I think it look great. I agree. I agree 100%. Um, and there's a move to modernize powers powers was traditionally an old man's drink when i was growing up in ireland and, a, and my mother's drink and you wouldn't have seen young people drinking it but there's been a big push from powers of late to engage bartenders around the united states in mm -hmm. cocktail creation and actually for those of you who are tuned in from ohio at the moment keep your eye out in our facebook group because i'm going to do i'm partnering with powers next month in september we're going to do an event a cocktail event uh, with powers uh, and and local honey ohio honey and we're going to make some interesting cocktails. And Derek, the global brand ambassador for Powers, is going to join us. We're going to do a fun event to introduce more of you to Powers whiskey and the cocktails that you can make with it. Some of you might think that's sacrilege throwing Powers into a cocktail. I think the better ingredients, the better the cocktail. And I think David agrees with me on that. 100%, yeah. 100%. Okay, so let's, let's shift gears. I want to know everything there is to know about peated whiskey. And as we're pouring our Bill Phil, which is the next one we're moving on to, I want to remind, you may not remember this, David, but we were at Whiskey Live last year in Dublin. Yeah. And I, I was walking by one of the stands and you grabbed me by the arm and you yanked me with all the force 
of a bodyguard trying to remove somebody from a, a nightclub or from, uh, out of the way of a celebrity. And you said, sound like me at all, Barry. <laughs> you, said, you have to try this. And you took a bottle of very peated scotch. And I think it was Octomore, if I recall. It was correctly. Octomore, yeah. It was Octomore. You said, drink this, drink it. Very precipitous. <laughs> I don't yeah, think I gave you much of a choice. <laughs> <laughs> drink it, drink it. And, um, and I thought, that's very different. I can't tell you if I like it or love it, because I'm still in shock at being dragged off the floor towards this scotch. But uh, <laughs> it was interesting, nonetheless. I am still a newbie when it comes to peat. And I'm relying now on experts and enthusiasts to change my mind as to why it shouldn't be thrown in the fire to give us fuel rather than drying out the barley. Well, <laughs> I think um, for me, I, I, I discovered peat early on. I, I think I mentioned earlier that um, you know one of my one of my earliest whiskey experiences was discovering Lagavulin, which is if anyone who's had that knows that it's quite peated and, and medicinal and what have you. Um, so I think it's absolutely fantastic. And you know, for me, the the, the Bill Phil is certainly one of the most exciting. Um, Irish whiskey releases of, of 2020. I'll probably compile a list, um, which I have no blog to put it on because I've just been too lazy to, 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 to kind of take that step. But I'm going to compile, li compile a list toward the end of the year of my most exciting whiskey releases in, in 2020. And there's every possibility that the Bill Phil will be above the fold on that one because it's, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. As you know, we said before, it's like three years and nine months. Um, so very young, but when you have peated whiskeys, I think um, they can show very, very well at a at a young age. I think uh, we, you know we should with, sure we have we have um, Dahi O'Connell, founder of WD O'Connell. He's in the chat on Facebook. Um, whether he likes to be called out or not, we're calling him out, and you can tag him and ask him questions. Uh, you'll you'll hear a podcast interview with Dahi this week on stories and sips. But Dahi is the the brains behind this release. Uh, I released it last, uh, introduced it last year at, at Whiskey Live, and it's yeah. relevant. So there was a, there was a single cask last year, um, which was a, it was a single cask release, and then for this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the batch one, which is make made up of two casks, slightly older, um, and then of course uh, what's what's super exciting is that there is, um, and I'll take full credit for this one myself. I'm joking, of course, but there is a cast strength version of the Bill Phil. Which is to be released very soon. Um, I'm hoping in the next in the next couple of weeks. Um, so maybe maybe Dahi will be able to um, give us a little more detail on that. But it is meant to be coming very very soon. I see Dan Pennington is a is a is a big fan of the cast strength one. I haven't got to taste it yet, um, but really really looking forward to getting my grubby little mitts on on a bottle or two of that. Hopefully two Dahi if you can swing it. <laughs> What are your thoughts on, like, like I guess when I tell people about the resurgence of peat in Ireland and you've got distilleries now that are producing, all, like Schlieve League Distillery is going to focus on peated whiskeys, uh, this resurgence. There's, there's this, Nesting, I believe, in Mayo as well. You've got Hinch, yeah. which are doing this. You've got, the, uh, obviously, Dahi here as well. Um, Graham down in Dingle is starting to distill some, some peat. I've actually got a sample of the new make off of... Um, off of uh, Bridger, the brewer in Western Herd and Claire went down there and got some, got a couple samples of the new make of the peat and I haven't tasted it yet, but I'm really looking forward to trying that. So there certainly is a resurgence and I, I get that it doesn't kind of suit everyone's palate, but you know, there's, there's, there's palate re-education camps that those people can be sent to. Do why, do we need, <laughs> why do we need peat though? Haven't we enough other whiskey, great whiskey? Is there a, why do we need peat or whiskey? My, this is my palate talking now, as you can tell. Well, look, look for me, Barry. It's just about variety, isn't it? Like, you know, I I have um, a bunch of bottles open. I probably forty five bottles open at the moment. Um, each of them different, and my mood is different on a on a given day, right? Um, you know, if I I'm the type of guy where if I go to the to a pub and I drink six or seven beers, ideally there'll be six or seven different beers. Um, so you know, I like to jump around from a style perspective, and you know, for me, uh, a peated whiskey gives. Um, just a completely different type of sensory experience than a non-peated whiskey can. Um, it's neither better nor worse. It's just it's just different. Fair and, enough. You know, for, for me, variety is good. I get bored quickly. It must be that's good. Maybe that's ADD or something. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't take it as a personal insult when peated whiskeys are being introduced, just because I don't like <laughs> taken to them as much as I've taken to others. But I hope those of you who are watching and do like peated whiskey 
embrace the fact that I'm willing to go down this journey and continue it and not just say, I don't like Pete, I'm done. I'm going to keep well, going. I, and, and to be honest with you, Barry, that's kind of to be to be commended because, you know, it's one of those things where um, if it, if someone doesn't like it the first time, they can easily just decide, you know, I don't like that and then and then leave it behind. And I think it's a shame because I think you're 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 missing out on some some fantastic right. and varied varied experiences. What I think that you know the best way to approach something like this for someone who isn't particularly into Pete, <clears throat> excuse me, is to try to try to think beyond just the smoke element and think mm-hmm. about the other complexities that it, that it brings. So you're from you're from Cork. I, you're, I think you're actually from Cove, isn't that right? I am indeed. So coastal Cork. So you know you smell this. You know what it's like to be standing on the seashore when the tide goes out, right? So the tide goes out, you've got the kelp and the dillisk or whatever that remains on the shore. And then it might be a warm day that starts to dry out. And you get that kind of aroma of the seaweed, almost like an iodine thing type of, type of thing going on. If you get past the smoke, you can get some of that in this, I think. You get some of that kind of seaweed that's kind of basking in the sun. You're painting a lovely romantic picture for me. I'll give you that. <laughs> the other thing about this here is um, I get a lot of lemon curd for me. I, I, I think actually Dahi was on this, yeah. this show before and mentioned that I that I'd said that I think this is, you know, you get that kind of lemon meringue pie made with like the really good like Amalfi lemons from, from Italy. So, and of course you get that smoke, that bit of funk, that bit of diesel, but, you know, for me it's that, it's that kind of seaweed that's kind of basking in the, in the, in the sun, on the seashore, particularly on the west coast of Ireland, is what it makes me think about. Even though this stuff is distilled in County Louth, but um, you know, I get that. I get the lemon, and then the smoke. So I, you know, what I try to do is tell people to kind of think about all these other things. That if you look right. past the smoke, you can kind of make connections with different elements of the whiskey, and the smoke starts to become, you know, more of I'm not saying necessarily in the background, but more of a, a supporting element to the, all the other complexities that are there. So blind them, blind them with romance of low tide in Cove, and then yeah, sip on this, and that don't even mention yeah. that it's peat whiskey, and then they think they're drinking a glass of low tide in in, in White Point Beach in Cove, which, as Quivine says, you don't want to know what Cove smells like when the tide goes out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was more specifically thinking about um, either the uh, the shore here in Moville. Or else in in New Key and in, in North Clare, but I'm going to guess that it's not too different. Uh, you probably don't have the uh, the ocean liner traffic up in Moville that you do down in Cove. The, the, the gas- is, funny enough, there is because we've we've, we've loads of um, uh, tankers that come up and down the foil actually. Okay. And if it and the, and and so a lot of you've got a lot of big big tankers that come down the foil uh, heading into Derry, and then if you have some someone that's going over to Scotland and the seas get quite rough, they'll pull into the foil because it's very um, it's very sheltered. So there actually is some 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 fairly big ships that come through, I, mainly mainly tankers, I think, or barges. Well, my takeaway so far is that I, I like I like your 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 hierarchy of nosing. Where forget the smoke, look at look at the other pieces first. I like that hierarchical approach because I am getting that lemon curd, a kind of a creamy lemon curd on the nose, and exactly it's not like a custardy, like a, almost like a like a buttermilk type of sour sour type of cream. Uh, yeah, cream. yeah, yeah. I'm not against it. That's the highest compliment an Irishman can, can give. I'm not against it. This isn't the worst. No. Okay. I so can, let's, can... <laughs> let's ahead. keep keep. Um, so you've moved on to the taste. I haven't tasted it yet. We taste peated whiskey the same as we taste any other whiskeys, right? We'll swirl it around our mouth, coat our tongue, leave mm-hmm. it in our mouth for a few seconds. Again, you're going to get that. You're going to get that creaminess. There's no doubting the creaminess. Mm-hmm. like a sour cream, that lemon curd. You know, I, I mentioned lemon meringue pie, but lemon meringue pie kind of has that lemon filling that's a little bit translucent. Yep. I'm more thinking about like the, like that opaque custardy lemon tart. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that, 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 that has that kind of egginess to it, that egg yolk, and I guess probably some cream in it as well. I don't know. I, I haven't made that. My wife makes it, but, um, you know, that with the, yeah, with that slight maritimeness, there is a—I don't know if it's actual saltiness, but you kind of perceive it as saltiness. You know, those are the influences that I get more so than just the smoke, and I—that's possibly because you know I'm more used to smoky whiskey, so I can—it's easier for me to possibly look past 
that initial smokiness and to, to get into these underlying complexities. But there's there's no question that they're there. I mean, it's not just a simple smokiness for sure. So for those of our audience that, that aren't familiar with peated whiskeys and, or Irish peated whiskeys even, the process of what is peat? So peat is a, it's a turf, it's, it's a condensed earth, a bog where millions of years of vegetation have compressed uh, with moisture to form a very thick, brown, heavy uh, soil that gets dug up, dried out, uh, becomes a fuel that you can use to put in your home and, and heat your house. It burns very slowly with a lovely smell. Or what we're now seeing increasingly is it's being used as a as a method, as a fuel for drying out the, the malt, the barley, uh, after it has been um, soaked in water in a, in a dark room to, to stop the germination process. It's being dried over a, a smoky fuel as opposed to a dry heat that most Irish whiskies are, are their malt is, dry, is, uh, is dried over. Um, it's not very common in the United like, I don't know what in the United States would compare in terms of that origin story of, of bogs. Is there anything like it in the United States? There probably is somewhere, but it's certainly nothing that I would have come across. I see Nick Ryan said something there about um, exploring the terroir of peat. I, that's absolutely something I would love to see because there's no question that different bogs have different organic makeup, uh, different vegetation, different types of animals that may have died there. You, you, you'd have bogs that would have been lifted from ancient uh, uh, seabeds and stuff like this. So there's no doubt that the organic compounds and those are going to be different. Um, you know, and, and, and just the way that tobacco grown in different places is going to make a cigar taste different. I have absolutely zero doubt that, um, that, 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 that the terroir of peat certainly is a, is a, is a thing. Um, that's a fascinating, that's, 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 that's there to be discovered. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not something that I've, I don't, I don't know if I've seen it done yet. I think different, if you look at, in Scotland, different distilleries get their peat from different places. So that has to have an impact. What I haven't seen is 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 someone kind of try to explore that in the way that Waterford have with the terroir of barley. But yeah. there's certainly some, some. I expect I expect that'll get done by someone. That sounds like a, a project for technical fans like yourself and Nick Ryan to dive into at some point yeah. together. <laughs> uh, and for those of you who don't know, Nick, Nick is a, a spirits educator and the man behind um Tome and gate irish whiskey bringing whiskey back to limerick it's got barley growing there in limerick for the first time for malting as well um and so it's great to see so many whiskey personalities here joining us tonight as well what well, you know i might add about the about the, the the bill phil here is that it's a fairly heavily peated whiskey right so it's not a um it's not uh it's not entry level, if you know what I mean. It's not like it's lightly peated and, and delicately peated so that, you know, someone who hasn't had peated whiskey, it might be a great place to start to kind of ease themselves into it. This is kind right. of getting into the into the into the deep end. I mean, this is the 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 barley here and Dahi will correct me if I'm wrong, I believe is peated to fifty five parts per million, which is quite high. Lagavulin, modern Lagavulin is in the thirties. I think mm. Ardbeg Ardbeg is in the forties or fifties. Okay. So, you know, we're talking about fairly heavily peated. Now, interestingly enough, the distillery that this comes from, they talk about the, their, their phenolic parts per million, which is essentially a measure of peatiness. In terms of the peatiness of the spirit itself, as opposed to the malted barley, um, distilleries in Scotland, when they talk about their parts per million, they're talking about the, the, the peatiness of the barley. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think the, the spirit is in the 30s. But the barley itself is 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 I believe 55 uh, parts per million, which is fairly heavily peated. So this isn't necessarily something like you're 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 easing into it. You're you're jumping into a heavily yeah, peated yeah, whiskey. Yeah. But well, it's like not. I, I don't think it's 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 aggressive in any way. It does come across fairly even-handed and 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 quite velvety. But again, I'm saying that as someone who 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 likes who likes it. So. <laughs> Well, you mentioned um, you mentioned two stacks earlier. Two stacks has one percent uh, peated whiskey component. So one of the, yeah. the components is peated whiskey, and it's the lightest, mm. most lovely little subtle, like a little wisp of smoke past your nose, and you looked around to wonder and wonder where it came from. That's yeah. Me, and if I had if I had to if I had to, I, I kind of wish they'd used more. <laughs> but, but that's just that's just you're me. never happy. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm, I'm actually quite happy with my bottle of two stacks. But if, if they if they ask my opinion about what to do for batch two, I'd say just crank that up to maybe five or six percent. 
Brian says, Brian Houston says, Scottish maltsters have done a lot of uh, this research already, the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute, and uh, they've got a quite a head start on us. Although Irish yeah, whiskey historically, no, was, we, did, we did use peat historically. Uh, it was used fairly widespread um, in Ireland historically. Technological advances um, in terms of dry heat allowed us to move away from some of that and for, for other reasons. And so for many years, we haven't really had... There's been no... Irish whiskey that has been that has contained malt that has been peated in Ireland, to the best of my knowledge, for many many years. Even Connemara uses malt that's peated in Scotland, to my knowledge. Yeah. Somebody else will correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. So no, it's only that's right. And this this is this is this is also not peated in Ireland, to 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 my understanding. And Dahi definitely jump in if I've if I've got that wrong. Well, we didn't have um, facilities in Ireland, did we? There wasn't the it, Ireland wasn't set up. Malt, now there are malt houses that are that are gearing up and are in produ in production right now, malting on over a peat fire. Um, but even uh, we had Graham Cool on here from Dingle a few weeks ago. He mentioned yeah. how their peated whiskies they're using malt from England, not even Scotland. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think there's 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 one that I'm aware of, and their name escapes me, but they're 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 setting up or have just started to do. Um, actually malting with 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 peat in Ireland which is which is a fantastic development um, you know I think it's it's I, I like the idea of Irish barley and Irish malt being used in Irish whiskey um, certainly obviously that's a that's a big thing for Waterford it's not a big thing for everybody um, which is which is fine I, I I wouldn't be of the opinion that some are where Irish distilleries should be required to use Irish barley but I certainly like it when they do I think there's scope for more of that to occur, and and certainly if if I were setting up a distillery, it would be it would be my policy anyway. So the idea of being able to get um, peated Irish malt, I think is is is, is certainly attractive. To it me is, anyway. it is, and um, oh yeah, Chris, correct me there on the on the percentage: two percent triple distilled peated malt in two stocks, two stacks, uh, three okay. percent Oloroso cask in dark silky, and fifteen percent Oloroso cask in dark silky. Uh, let me see, Killone and Mikkel peating their own malt. Yeah, so that's a, an amazing, the, the stories and the, just trying to keep up with what's happening. Anytime I'll, I, and I'm, I'm very glad of the the, the fact checking in real time, th thanks For to sure, such yeah. a, as Chris Hennessy, because it's very hard to keep up with just what's happening. And there's also many things happening behind the doors, behind closed doors that we don't know about yet. And all of a sudden, there'll be a ta-da moment where somebody reveals something nobody had any idea they were working on, which is very exciting. Well, you know what's funny about that as well is I think we've all got a little bit of inside information here and there about different things going on, and none of us can talk about it. You know, I probably have one or two nuggets in my head. You probably have wait, what do you know? Fourteen little nuggets in your head, but you're what, not going to tell know? me. Isn't it? You're not going to tell me any more than I'm going to tell you. So, <laughs> Listen, um, I'm but, but, anything. <laughs> but I will tell you this, Barry: it is impossible to keep up with everything. Um, and, and it's only going to become more so, you know, we've got there's 30 odd distilleries in Ireland. Now you're starting to get, um, in, in the next say two to five years, there's going to be an influx of, um, kind of own make, uh, releases from these distilleries where they may have been sourcing before, or may have been releasing nothing before. And we're going to start seeing a lot of these distilleries come online and it's going to be getting more and more difficult to keep on top of absolutely everything. Uh, it'll be impossible, in fact. So it's 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 um, it's it's almost, you know, it's actually it's actually a great thing though because you know when the when the when the when the scene is so diverse and so vibrant that you can't keep up, you're in this constant state of like excitement and discovery, which is really really fun. Stress and panic, or <laughs> fear of missing out. A fear of missing out. You try, you know. I think that's another good thing about about. The, the expansion of this um, category, though, is that, you know, it'll you'll get to the point where you give up trying to have everything because there's just so much of it you can't. And I think when you when you let that go, it becomes a lot less stressful. Like I stress I stress like hell whenever there's a JJ Corey release because I have to have everything, I have to have everything. And I do. Um, Luckily, we've been we've been lucky. Me and a few group of other collectors have been lucky enough to be able to kind of find everything we've been looking for. But it's always when we hear about a rumor of a new release, there's there's always that bit of stress. So, you know, I think um, 
and, you know, and kind of a little bit the same with Waterford as well. I try to get, track down everything they do, and that's going to become impossible because it looks like they're going to have yeah. like 20 odd releases every year, you know. But um, I, I think it'll get to the point where, you know, the, this completism will kind of fade away and it'll just be I into. It'll just be into um, more of just kind of chasing after bottles that you want and enjoying them, and some of that stress will get removed, which is probably going to be probably going to be a good thing. Well, I'm I'm always fascinated to see people collect entire ranges of every whiskey that's come out of a new distillery or every brand that's launched a new whiskey, and I'm always curious whether that's driven by interest in whiskey or interest in at some point flipping that collection for some profit. Uh, and look, whatever you want to do with your own money is is anybody's business. But I do love to see new whiskies, especially those that are unusual, that are different, that are strange in a good way, being opened, that are expensive, being opened. Uh, and, and that hashtag seal breakers is one I like to see turning up every now and again, because as uh, Billy Lighton said one time on here, he said uh, he, he doesn't make his whiskey to be gathering dust. He wants people to yeah. enjoy it. Uh, which and, well, I, you're a great champion for that, Barry. I mean, I, I've, I've seen you like from the, I think I first took notice of you doing that really when that the previous Dreamcast came out, the 20 year, then you open that thing up like right away. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, he just opened it. Um, and I've tried to, um, I've tried to adopt a, a kind of a similar approach, which is why, you know, with the Waterfords, this, um, this Rath Eden, I mean, this is selling for like 500 euros on auction, which is a bit ridiculous in fairness, but um, yeah, like you see, I've got mine. Own. Now that being said, you know, there's some element of hypocrisy there because I, I haven't opened my pilgrimage bottle. Um, and I have no idea when I will. Um, but even the, the founder of the distillery himself is going online saying, I don't recommend anybody opens that bottle. It'll be worth a few pounds in, in a few years to come. <laughs> I, I, see, I, see, I, I see that. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably good advice. Now, I will, I will say this, that I was lucky enough to get a, um, a sample of the pilgrimage off of Ned. Uh, so I will be able to taste it without opening, without opening mine. Now, before someone corrects me, and says that the sample that came with the pilgrimage bottle isn't actually the pilgrimage whiskey. That's true, but that's not what this is. This is actually a sample of the pilgrimage. Good, so good. I, I am looking forward to getting to taste it without having to, to open mine. And you know, so if, you I decide I, if I if I decide I need a new watch one day or something, I might sell. The, there you sell go. The or, or, or a new house or something, depending on how prices. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Jamie Cotter from Hinch Distillery in Northern Ireland has um, made a big. Um, offer here that if I drink another glass of Pete, he'll spill a few secrets. So Hinch Distillery uh, in construction, about to come online, uh, sourcing some whiskey at the moment, interesting whiskeys they'll be shipping to the United States very soon, to my understanding. Jamie, look, I've this much left. If I finish this, Pete, Bill Phil, will you share some secrets for us that we can have a little exclusive here on the lock -in? Uh, I think you said not, another uh, glass. I think you said another glass, Barry. I, I, Dave, I you did an Who's incremental glass. I am on your side. Okay. Man, this is for your own good, man. This is this is that part of that palate re-education camp we were talking about. Earlier. Follow my lead. Follow my lead. <laughs> I'm on something here. Uh, Jamie, give us an exclusive. I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying the Bill Phil. I'm enjoying it more than I even enjoyed it last time. And I I, I know that it's only because David painted a romantic picture of low tide in Cove and the smell of the, um, the oil-crusted uh, rocks down there in White Point and... Um, and the seaweed, but no, it is more enjoyable than before. So, okay, I will fill this up. I will drink another glass of this um, because I'm getting all kinds of stick, even from Dahi saying, that's not a glass, it's a drop. <laughs> all right, that's here we go. We're gonna drink this and enjoy it. And I want to hear some secrets from Hinch Distillery. All right, look, yourself. That's a good pour there now, to be fair, like, isn't it? That's Very, I do wonder if, if 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 I've slightly disappointed a few people and not said anything sufficiently controversial so far this evening. I don't know. I mean, if you want to scream obscenity, that's fine. Like you, <laughs> you, you later, later. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's um, that's if you have any, if, if anybody's got any questions for David Mara, David is an American in Ireland. He is a a drinks uh, fan, a super fan, a great promoter and supporter of Irish whiskey, and has been very kind enough to give us a very late night uh, of his time uh, from Ireland to join us tonight to help us taste and nose whiskeys and to learn a little bit from his perspective. Uh, everybody can learn from somebody else, and I can learn from people like David who have mature palates, uh, more mature than me, and help me understand what I should be 
and should not be perhaps doing to get a better experience. So feel free to put your questions in there uh, from Ireland or from um, United States or Canada, wherever you're joining us from, and we'll put them to David. Um, Dave, do you do you collect whiskey um, for future in, uh, yeah. maturation of value, not just <laughs> maturation of whiskey? Um, for future value. That's kind of my excuse for buying some of the stuff I buy is because I say it's going to be worth something that just kind of gets takes the heat off me for having bought it. <laughs> I don't know whether it's true or not. No, I think I collect whiskey for probably mainly for future drinking. Mm. So, you know, a lot of stuff I buy, I buy to consume in the near to medium term. Um, I don't open everything as soon as I buy it because... You know, since lockdowns came out, there's been just so many unbelievable releases that it's been a little bit of a buying spree recently, and I couldn't possibly um, open it all right away because then I'd never finish anything that I already have open, and you'd end up with just, you know, bottles all over the house um, that are that are kind of a third empty. Um, so there are very few things that I buy to collect for collecting's sake. Mm. Um, 95% of the bottles that I buy, they're, they're for drinking at some point. Now, when it comes to the best bottles that I've bought, like some of my kind of trophy bottles, which would be the likes of my Green Spot 26 year, my Red Breast uh, Palace Bar, my Red Breast Temple Bar. I've got some good bourbons, like some Dusty Wild Turkey, some um, George T. Stag, some stuff like that. Um, you know, some, 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 some pretty good, some pretty good scotch bottles as well. They're, they're for drinking, but they're for drinking later. So right. I'm kind of trying to build up in some ways, like a little bit of a retirement bunker so that, mm. you know, when I get to the, the period of my life where I'm not really earning much anymore um, and, you know, I don't have the budget to go out and procure stuff like this, um, that I have a certain stash of it set aside so that you know, I can I can kick back when it's all said and done, and just in, yeah, yeah. kind of enjoy those. I do the same thing with wine as well, Barry. So I buy wine, okay, and and to with a view to setting it aside for, you know, between ten and twenty five years. Um, now luckily, I started doing that about fifteen years ago. So I've I've got stuff kind of coming online that's ready to drink now. But I'm still, <clears throat> I'm still buying stuff, not huge amounts, but with it with a view to drinking those, you know, in my in my sixties, let's say. Um, of course, those will improve over time, whereas the whiskeys will stay the same. But right. but but all the same, you know, the idea is to um, it's kind of a retirement fund, but not in the sense that they're destined to be sold, but just destined to yeah. be consumed at a time in my life where I wouldn't be in a position to buy them. If, if that makes sense. It does make sense. Um, yeah, it's a it's a constant struggle I have with that, where I have some bottles that I've sought out to collect that I know will never be opened, but I. I, I've fallen emotionally in love with them, you know, mm -hmm. from the sense of whether it's the story, their origin, or I have some personal connection to it somehow. And maybe in time that gets handed down to somebody or it gets, maybe it gets sold in time, but the chance, there's some whiskeys I've found that just to look at them and be able to rub the bottle and maybe give it a little kiss every now and again is sufficient reason to hold on to some bottles and never open them. Yeah. I have a few like that. Um, there's, I mean, the, the, the Waterfield Pilgrims may be one. Um, I've, uh, you know, there's there's um, some of the J.J. Corys I have I will not be opening. I, I don't see myself opening my Bonders Blend 2. Um, luckily, I have a sample of it, which I haven't tasted, so I'll be able to I'll at least be able to know what it tastes like. So I do have some stuff like that where I probably won't open, um, but they'd be the minority. Mm. They'd be the, but, you know, I think that's okay as well. I mean, like, some people can be a little bit too militant about the, you know, you have to open everything, you have to drink everything. I think it's a good rule to live by. But, yes. you know, if everybody lived by that, we wouldn't have, you know, the likes of, you know, Chris Hen Hennessy scoring an old bottle of Powers from the 50s. Right. You know, yeah. so, you know, just because it doesn't get enjoyed now doesn't mean it never will. And That's so, right. you know, you know, the idea of, being a custodian of something that someone we may never meet will get to enjoy. That's right. You know, I'm sure that we're thankful that some others probably took that view 50 years yeah. ago, 50, 60 years ago with certain bottles. So you know, I wouldn't, I don't get, I don't get too militant about telling everyone they have to open everything. Um, 
but that's quite a different thing from kind of this insta flip you know where you buy something yeah. and then 10 minutes later you're, you're 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 flipping it that's kind of a different kind of a different thing and i can i can well, see I, why some that some people don't care for that but. i i'm already worried and maybe a little bit nervous and a, bit, a little bit sad in advance of when i'll see bottles of jj Curry, the story that we've put together for you know for, for for the community over here i know they'll appear on auction sites and look everyone can do what they want i'm very much in favor of free will and independence and you know this is a democracy and all but um i'm i would love to see people try more and more of these great whiskies and like that's one of the reasons why when we come out with this whiskey we decided to do all these miniature bottles so that yeah if you want to keep a big one or sell or whatever at least you have the miniature that you could taste and try it because we're the blend is going to be spectacular and if people that's a really good idea though that's a really good idea to do that because you know it's a big commitment to open a bottle like that when you if i look i'll tell you i'll tell you right now i'm really hoping to get one of those and i can mm -hmm. promise you if i if i get one i won't be opening it you know and the reason is is i've got a full full set of jj cory okay i don't have the the chosen um and i i, I choose to kind of not count that i guess the which is convenient for me, but I choose to not count that as part of the set, but I've got everything else. So, you know, that means I have to have one of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and if I open one of them, then I don't have one of everything anymore. So if I get one of those that you're doing, then I won't be able to open it, um, which is a bit of a shame. But at the same time, I like, you know, that's kind of the one thing that I, that I, that yeah, I collect yeah, in yeah. that way. And that's that kind of the bad. one thing that yeah. I do that with. But so I think the miniature is a great idea because, um, you know, it's still good to know what it tastes like. You know, mm -hmm. you don't need to drink it 20 times. You know, if you, if you drink it once or twice, then, you know, you've, you've, you've been able to experience it. And then, that's it. you know, it's there for someone else later on. So that's it. Um, lots of people jumping on the sports side of things. And asking Stanley Cup, I don't know. I'll tell you, I, 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 I you know, I'm a, I'm a Red Wings fan um, being be. from, from, from suburban Detroit. And I have to say that, you know, with the decline of the, of the Red Wings and, the fact that it's quite difficult to watch hockey over here, um, I haven't I haven't been following it as much as I'd like to in the last in the last couple of years. Um, I think the the American sport that I watch the most of over here is is American football. I'm an absolute diehard Lions fan. I've got I've got Detroit Lions shoes. <laughs> I've got Detroit Lions underwear. You know I've got beer koozies, Detroit Lions. I've got a, I've got a Detroit Lions jersey for my dog. <laughs> you know, and, and it's a, such a painful existence being a Lions fan, but but I'm, I I am, I embrace it. I kind of wallow in the misery. Let's <laughs> no, I, I yeah yeah. I went to a game a few years ago, a couple of years ago. I went to a, um, a Lions game in Detroit, and uh, a friend of mine is in the sports industry, and he managed to get us down on the field afterwards to try and kick oh, field. Oh, wow, cool. So we tried to kick field goals. I won't share the video of me trying attempting a field goal <laughs> on the field because it was woefully inadequate. Let me tell you, woefully inadequate. <laughs> and I think it's harder than it looks. Yeah, yeah, it but, is. Um, but no, I, 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 I do like hockey. I was, I, I, I used to go to a few games before I moved over here. And of course, everybody in, in Detroit is, is is hockey mad. But to be able to watch it here is difficult because. You know, even if you do have like a streaming package or something, the games are on, you know, at 730 in uh, Eastern time, which is like, you know, 1230 at night here. So and, you know, I'm not, not going to stay up from 1230 to four o'clock in the morning, you know, three nights a week. You know, I, I do I do have a job, thank God. Um, so I can't, I can't do that. Whereas the, with the football, you know, that's if it's a one o'clock game on a Sunday. That's 6 p.m. here on Sunday. So that's actually that's actually perfect. You know, yeah, I have a couple of buddies yeah. over. The guy from Texas that lives near me in Ennis. He's a Cowboys fan, but whatever. Um, but you know, I let him. I let him come over every once in a while. We drink. We drink a couple of beers or a couple of whiskeys and 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 and, and watch that. So, uh, I, I do keep very very close attention to the to the to the NFL. There's not much happening in the world of sports this year, though, is there? No, and you know this would normally be a time when I get really excited in the off season and training camp and stuff like this. And I know that it's all kind of kicking off now, and I do watch with great interest, you know, and I subscribe to the NFL Game Pass and I watch all that stuff. But I'm finding it more difficult to enjoy this part of the off season this year just because I'm not fully convinced that there's going to actually be a season. Right. Um, you know, so I, I suppose it's more difficult for me to become emotionally invested 
in what the Lions could be. You see, this is the thing about being a Lions fan is that every year you have this like fucking hope that just, you know, ends up just tearing your heart out and killing you. You, you feel like this is the year they're going to be good and then it never happens. Um, but that hope is really, it's a, it's a, it's a fun thing to indulge around this time of year before the games actually, and before the games and the losing starts, you know, uh, but, but it's, it's with, with not being sure that the season's actually going to happen. Um, you know, I, I kind of feel a little bit robbed of the, the most optimistic, part of the lion season which is which is before it starts but you turn up every year <laughs> like every year you'll put on that jersey every year you'll meet your buddies if you can every year you'll tune in and yeah. it's a remarkable every thing game. Every, every game game every have... game no matter what i mean like if 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 someone's got a communion on i'm like well you know i'll be there until about 4 30 but then i gotta get home and, and the game's on at six so it's a remarkable yeah. thing in, in ireland we have this as well with, with 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 county sports and hurling and football but it is a I, I've never witnessed anything like in the United States this this camaraderie around and and loyalty to team, uh, and mm. it's not always just based on where you come from. It often is, but uh, it's where maybe you end up as well. But there's this this idea of a, a community uh, that's that's built around a shared belief that one day it'll happen, and we're not going to go away until it does. Is a remarkable. Yeah, thing. you know, I I think that like those of us who 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 um. I don't want to say I, I suppose unlucky enough in some ways, but those of us who support teams that are kind of the perennial losers, there's this, um, there is a bit of a camaraderie or this kind of we're in it together. It's easy to be a Patriots fan. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's easy to be an Alabama fan. If you're into, if you're right. into college football, um, not easy to be a Lions fan. So, you know, we've, we've a lot of pain that we've gone through a lot of suffering, a lot of heartache, um, but I think you have to believe that at some point it'll happen and it'll be, it'll be all the sweeter. I mean, even like my wife hates it. She hates football. She absolutely hates it. But even she said, if the lions ever make the Super Bowl, I don't care what we have to do. You're going. And I didn't, you know, because she, I know. she, she right. She recognizes that as well. She's like, you're going, whatever we have to do, we're making it happen. You're going, if they're in the Super Bowl, you're going to shows. Now I'm not worried about it because it's probably never going to happen. <laughs> like, but... Doesn't it speak to something deeper inside of all of us? Like we're we're all looking for belonging. We want to belong to a group that thinks like us, that we share beliefs. We feel, and I think that's biological. We feel safety in numbers of people who are like us, so that when the wolves and the bears attack us, we're, we're all together. You know, but there's this this Neanderthal biological uh, drive inside us to find the people that that. Uh, oh, yeah. that are... I mean, there's that that kind of inherent tribalism, but I think as well for me, like the, it it. Um it it's a it's a it's a piece of home you know to be able to 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 log on and watch the and watch the lions and and yes nick i i agree that monster versus all blacks that happened i think maybe just a few weeks before i was born that was in 1978 i've seen some of the footage of that and that must have been an amazing amazing thing to okay so let's stop on this one because this is an interesting point so nick is highlighting a game of rugby that took place in 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 limerick was in thoman park Munster, where Munster, a regional team in Ireland, rugby team, beat... Amateur at the time. Amateur at the time, not professional. Amateur at the time, beat the greatest rugby team at the time, and maybe still to this day, are uh, up there in the top three or four every year of the greatest rugby teams of all time, and they beat them. And I don't know the capacity of Thomond Park. Is it 20,000 people uh, or something? Not, not super far off that, but I think... Eight million people have claimed to have been at that game <laughs> and, and claimed that they were there to see that win. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's it is definitely legendary. There was even um there was actually a stage play that was um that was based upon that. Can't remember what it was called now, but it was done in it was it was it was performed in Dublin there a few years ago. Um so a very legendary, very legendary sports match for sure. <laughs> um but yeah, I mean and that's another thing, like coming over here to Ireland, like I mean the 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 sporting scene here is absolutely fantastic. And I've really embraced all the the um Dahi says he was there. I, Dahi, we probably weren't much older than I was. About hundred thousand people. <laughs> he's, he's probably bigger younger than I am, you know. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, it's such a great sporting scene here with hurling and football, especially hurling. Hurling yeah. is just a fantastic sport. I mean, anyone who's not watching hurling is missing out. Um, but rugby as well is just it's just a fantastic sport. And you know, anyone who's into American football can easily get into rugby as well, and 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 vice versa. It just takes a 
little bit of open mindedness and learn learn something a little bit a uh, little bit new. Pro sports are absurd mercenaries. Yeah, I mean there is that. Yeah, that's what's great about this. Is, this is so great. Of, this is so great about the GAA though. You know, is that yeah, um, amateur. It, it is. Yeah, I mean it's kind of like the the college football of of, of Ireland, and you know this is, these are people that have jobs during the day. Oh, it sounds to me like it looks to me like you're 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 probably you should be getting into some of those um, secrets from Jamie. Last drop yeah. of the second pour. Yeah. Um, we're yeah. looking to hear some secrets from Jamie at Hinch Distillery. Come on, drop them. I'm finishing this. <laughs> I'm going to go back onto a drop of powers. Um, before I do, um, and and Dave, you've been very kind with your time. And as always, I I give. I should have told you at the start. But at any time, I tell my guests just get up and walk away uh, when it's time for bed because it's. I know it's late, but at any time you can just leave, and then I know it's my signal to turn off your connection. Well, you see, now that the whiskey's flowing and I've had a few, you may notice that I had an extra John's lead and I had an extra Bill Phil, so you'll be you'll be pulling the plug on me. <laughs> <laughs> But well, listen, while I have you here, um, what, and while I have a, a still a good audience here, and we'll talk about this during the week as well, next week on the live stream, we are doing a really fun event. We are doing a Kill Began takeover of the live stream. And what that means is we're going to have a session. And I mean a proper session. We're bringing on a musician um, uh, from Cork who lives in Chicago, who's going to play for us throughout the night. I'm bringing on Michael Egan, brand ambassador here in the United States for Kilbegan. We're going to have so much fun. I've got three whiskeys from Kilbegan that we're going to be tasting. I've got their single pot still, which is here. I've never even tasted this one. Look, That's the one with the 5% oats. I've not had that one, and, I've, and, and everyone loves it, and it's just so stupid that I haven't had it. I really need I'll to. I've tried that yet either. I've got their. Do you, do, you have, do you have the rye? I have the small batch rye here ah, yeah, no, that is that is killer that is that is really really good and we've got their blend so we are going to do a kilbegan takeover we're going to have a night at kilbegan we're talking the history of the kilbegan distillery we're going to do some trivia and we're going to do tons of giveaways so kilbegan have been kind enough to give me so many things we got t-shirts caps hats socks look i got kilbegan socks we got all kinds of things here look we got badges. We got all kinds of things, pins. Anyway, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really excited because I'm fascinated by the history of Kilbegan and their continuous fight with Bushmills for the claim of the oldest distillery in Ireland. I gave Jack Ferris from Bushmills the chance to um, assert his claim over that on the podcast two weeks ago. That. Yep, I heard that. I heard that. <laughs> Egan's going to come on and dispute and debate that fact. We're going to have a great old time. Um, so for those of you who are part of our Facebook group, Irish Whiskey Fans of America, stay tuned because Kilbegan have also given us some discount codes. If you do want to buy any of these Kilbegans before next week, we got some money off, which is great news. So look, this is what happens when the community grows. We're getting to do some great things with some fun, fun things with great distilleries and brands, and we're going to try and do more of those things. So that's next week. Bosh. Tonight, we're still sipping away with David Mara, who refuses to leave, and we don't mind that at all. That's a good thing. Well, I'll tell you now, for the for the sake of your viewers there, the Kilbegan stuff, that rye is fantastic. And it's a, it's a completely different um, rye experience to, to, you know, most of your American viewers will have had, um, you know, American rye whiskeys. It's completely different from that. It's very much an Irish whiskey. Um, it's 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 basically a pot still whiskey except that it's not compliant with the uh with the technical file because there's too right. much rye in it but um it's really really good i believe it's only 43 percent um That's right. but it yep. it is it is packed with flavor i i i tasted that for the first time at an aviators whiskey society tasting it, it was actually the first tasting of it i ever went to at the aviators and uh john cashman who used to be the um uh global brand ambassador for them yep he present he presented that and and we were the first we were the first people to taste that it was before it was released and it, the, the the way that rye just when it hits your palate it just kind of expands it's so expansive across the palate like right away um it, it, it it's really a, a flavor explosion that you wouldn't expect to get out of something necessarily at 43 percent it's an absolutely fantastic whiskey now here it's like 55 euros because of the aforementioned excise duties but yes. in the us i think it's like i don't even maybe less than 40 dollars. it's 40 like just ridiculous. Yeah. yeah it's just it's ridiculous like, it's a, this is absolutely smashing by like i mean 
I would I, I would honestly tell anyone to go out and get that. It, it really is good. It's remiss of me that I haven't tasted the pot still with the with the oats. Um, yep. But the, the the rye one is excellent. I have an unopened, I have an as yet unopened bottle at home, um, of the of the rye, but it, it, it is really excellent. I'm going to get the I'm details for those of you in the United States. I'll have the details this week of which states stock this and sell this. For those of you who want to drink along and want to take advantage of the discount code. But what's really interesting to me about Kilbegan is how their history has been tied to some fan fantastic events in the history of Ireland. Like I did a video when I first started Stories and Sips back in. 2018 one of my first videos was how a distillery almost brought down the irish government and it's a story in the 1950s i believe of insider trading and backhanders with the government and promises of this and that and selling distilleries and stocks an amazing story that's so just not too different from now than barry right i mean it sounds it's, like it's just like today it's like uh <laughs> <laughs> we're not gonna listen Somebody tweeted this week that you were going to you were going to get into controversial things, and I said you were only going to talk about religion, politics, gender, race, sex. Um, you've yeah. touched on none of those tonight, which is good news so far. I've touched on none <laughs> of those, and I have, I have zero intention of doing so, Barry. Uh, much to the dismay, much to the dismay of of, of many of our uh, respective Twitter followers, I'd say. But <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Dave, is this your first kind of outing? Like you've been hiding behind a Twitter profile for a few years. Is this your first yeah. big appearance? This, yeah, I mean, yeah, this is my big break, dude. <laughs> your big break. <laughs> I feel sorry this for you. Big, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm. I, I guess I'm easier to get along with in person than I am online. Perhaps I don't know. But <laughs> no, this is my first. Uh, this is my first thing like this. Uh, but it's, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Um, it's been, you make it easy though, Barry, Do you know what I mean? You're, you're, you're a great conversationalist and you kind of, you know, you draw the conversation out of people. So, so you're, you're kind of like the Barbara Walters of, of, of whiskey people and that you can, <laughs> you get people talking and you kind of make them feel comfortable. At least you haven't come in and hit me with any of the really hard questions, which is, which I appreciate. I suppose. Well, I'm going to change my Twitter bio tomorrow to the Barbara <laughs> Walters of Irish whiskey. <laughs> David Mara quote. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, I meant that in the, only in the best of ways, Barry. No, in fairness. <laughs> it's funny, about, about an hour before we went live tonight, uh, Mrs. Stories and Sips and I, we were sitting here in the apartment and we looked at each other and we said, will we go for a pint? <laughs> and it's an hour before we kicked off and we looked at the watch and we said, we will. We went for, so we went for a pint. We went up the town in San Diego to uh, the Dubliner pub and we had a pint of Guinness. And I pulled out my phone and I said, you have to help me now. I need to get some questions for Dave. Like I want to make sure we have all the questions. And so we, we, we got about two questions in. The first one was, how did David get to Ireland? And the second one was, I can't even remember what the second one was. And then I said, I don't know. We'll just have the crack. Sure, it's just like sitting in the corner. Of the pub. <laughs> so we put the phone away. We enjoyed our pints. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you, I've I'm, I'm, I'm poured more of this Rath Eden. And this is just, this is just damn good whiskey. I'm it's back just got such, it's got such depth. And 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 I I, I kind of want to say power, but it's not aggressive. It's just what's going to happen is over time. Do you think? I mean, how is that going to change over time? Uh, you know, it's hard for me to say, and I'll tell you why. Because I've had very few um, mature whiskeys that I also had the chance to taste when they were three years old, mm. right? So, and this is one of the things I think is such, that makes now such a great time to be into Irish whiskey. Like if you look at, if I think about my favorite scotches, you know, I'm thinking about things like Lagavulin or, you know, certain art bags. Um, I'm a big Glen Goyne fan. I'm an Edradour fan, you know, some of these whiskeys and how cool would it be to be able to go back and taste the original, the first Lagavulin at three and a half right. years old? Right. You know, that's a privilege we'll never have. Um, so I don't know what it was like then and how it evolved over time. So, you know, we're lucky enough to where we're tasting, you know, Bill Phil at three years and nine months and we're tasting, you know, Rath Eden at, at three years and however months that is. Um, what the future holds, I, 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 I can't say, but it's certainly promising, mm. you know, and, and, and I think 
that's what's so great about about now. If you look at how Dingle has progressed over the last last few years, you know, from their first release, which I was lucky enough to taste that, um, on to the to the fifth release, and we're seeing kind of that progress. Yes. Uh, you look, at te- look at Teeling, you know, their first pot still release. You see how that's progressed to the third release, and then that single cast that say sixty four percent or whatever um, in Virgin American Oak. That's just smashing the distillery exclusive. Um, you know, so we're in this hugely privileged position that we get to experience these, you know, what I think will history will deem to be great distilleries um, in their infancy at a period when no one else in history is going to going to have the opportunity to do that. So it's certainly um, just a fantastic time to be to be in this community and, and in the in the scene, I guess, um, you know, great time to be exploring this. What's Waterford was one of those things where. I know from the early days you were very interested in what was coming. You were a big fan of you were you were bullish from day one, saying they're onto it. They're, they've hit on something important here. That's not just marketing hype. There's substance to it. Waterford is out there now. You've been flying the flag uh, as you know. Just what I do respect very much about you, David. And there's not a lot I don't dis- I don't that I don't respect. But you, you're you're a man of your word, and you're you're a man of conviction, and you. You, you get behind something and you follow it through and I think mm-hmm. I think you do your research before you you nail your 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 um your proclamation to the door but once you do that's the proclamation um now the Waterford is out there and you've you've I think it's been born true for you there that what they were doing has resulted in a, in, in in a quality whiskey and more to come but I'm curious what is on your radar next or what are you interested in or excited about in the world of Irish whiskey that we haven't yet seen? So, you know, if you look at a lot of the brands that that we have right now, you have, you know, a small number of distilling, distilleries that those liquids are coming from. And you have a lot of people doing some really creative things with those liquids in order to differentiate themselves from one another. Um, a lot of that is out of necessity, but I think what kind of the unspoken thing about that, or at least maybe what people haven't considered yet is the creativity that is being hatched out of necessity in order to do that. Mm-hmm. So. You know, when we see these distilleries coming online with their own stuff, because they've been kind of forced into this creative space, that I think we'll see that continue on in their own stuff when it, when that starts to get released. Mm. And that, you know, there's going to be this divergent evolution of, you know, different distilleries starting off with different juices mm. that they've created. And then applying the creativity that they've had to come up with and had to adopt in the early sourcing days. And then when you combine that with their own, with their own spirit, I think we, we have just a huge diversity um, ahead of us. I think grain is a massive potential in Irish whiskey. You know, I think single grain and virgin oak is a, is a huge space that I'd like to see explored a lot more. You know, we talked about the silky, silky dark earlier, Yes. you know, that, that peated one, but you know, as much peat as there is, there's a lot of grain in Asian virgin oak going along with that as a great combination. So, so I think there's, a, is a massive potential. Oh, the, the, the audio is getting wonky on me there. Oh. Um, so I, you know, I, I think that, you know, there's, a huge variety to be to be to be had and i think that's one of the most exciting things there are a number of distillers and brand owners strangely enough popping up in two distinct areas of ireland that are very firm in their beliefs the cipherous immovable on their beliefs and i absolutely love it when i'm not drinking whiskey my day job is helping businesses think about their own beliefs and vision, et cetera. And so I love honing in on these brands and businesses that have that same immovable belief. Waterford is one of those areas, but it's not just Waterford Distillery. There's the Blackwater Distillery and Ed Ed Powers asks about that as well. And also we've got Northern Ireland, like Northern Ireland, especially County Down, incredible things happening in Northern Ireland. Um, 
these distillers and brands are, have to somewhat swim upriver against the current because of how things have been done historically. Um, mm. Does that, how does that help them or hold them back when you think that they need mass market appeal to really make it? Well, I think it helps them in that, you know, there's so much stuff that's already been done. There's no point well, in some ways, I mean, it's hard to say there's no point, but for me, seeing another version of something I'm already used to is less interesting than seeing someone doing something that's unique. Mm -hmm. You know, so you mentioned County Down and, and you know, obviously Brendan Carty in, in, in Cologne comes to mind. You know, what he's doing there is insane. You know, I've been to his place. Um, it's the size of my kitchen. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, he's doing these open fermentations where he's not even inoculating with yeast. He's just kind of, you know, he's, he's just letting the, the ambient yeast come in. He's got this peated pot still, which the, the, the mash is allowed to sour as it ferments outside in these like plastic cubicle containers. You know, I went there, it was about a year ago, I guess, at this stage, and he, um, he was having an event for some of his investors and he, he welcomed myself, my wife there anyway, and he grabbed a pint glass and he opened up the fermenter and dipped the pint glass into the fermenter and said, look, this is my peated pot still. It's mostly <laughs> fermented and it's pretty sour, taste it, you know, and Jesus, it was delicious, you know, so I mean, like, there's just great stuff going on there. Um, there is. You know, some, someone mentioned Blackwater, like, you know, what they're doing with, with kind of reviving some of these old pot still recipes you know, whether they're compliant with the techo file or not is, is irrelevant. Um, but I think exploring some of these old pot still recipes is super cool. So, you know, essentially what you have with those two distilleries is, you know, you've got Blackwater that's kind of looking back on the past, trying to re recreate some of that stuff. You've Brendan Carty, who's doing his thing in Cologne. You've, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I can't remember the name of the distillery that's just opened in East Clare, where they're, they're doing something completely different with a bunch of different grains, wheat, and Glen, stuff like this. Um, what's that? Glen Ree, Glen Ree Distillery. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, they're kind of saying, we're not looking into the past and seeing what was done historically. We're just going to embark on something completely new and different. You know, so you have all these different approaches that people are taking. And the winner is people like me, people right. like you, that are just interested in Irish whiskey, um, want to try stuff, want to experience different things. Um, you know, we're, we're the real winners out of all this because we don't have to pick a side. We can yeah. choose them all. <laughs> you know? yeah, no, so so it, that for me is just super exciting. And you've got that, that, that creativity and, and, and passion and excitement that you can really feel when you talk to a lot of these people, I think is, um, is just super, super it, exciting. It's palpable, the change, the progression, the, the move to innovation in Ireland is really interesting. You've got, at the moment, we're at this bridge between old Irish, old Irish whiskey. When I say old Irish whiskey, I'm talking New Middleton, which is only 1975 to today. So you've got this old, for our generation, old, I, I was born the same year you were, Dave, 1978. That old Irish whiskey, because new Irish whiskey is these distilleries that are also doing this non-technically compliant distilling. And the Irish Whiskey Association has this very difficult job of straddling these two approaches where historically the technical legal definition of Irish whiskey was defined according to how it was made from 1975 on. And now you've got these new distilleries that are saying, yeah, but we found the recipe from 1842 that shows it was made this way. Can we not call that Irish whiskey? And it's a really difficult um, thing for them to navigate, I'm sure. And I posed that question this week to, to John Quinn, Tullamore Jew, Global Brand Ambassador. He is the assistant chair of the um, Irish Whiskey Association, an incoming chair. And I asked him, how does the Irish Whiskey Association balance the needs of the incumbent existing distilleries and consumers? And he was quick to shut me down, and I'm glad he did. He said, oh, whoa, whoa. He said, the, the needs of both are the same thing. It has to be, we have to work towards quality for the consumer. It doesn't mean that the old rules that are enshrined today will live forever, mm -hmm. but I don't think there's any desire to prevent innovation, but rather there's things moving so quickly right now that it's probably tough to figure out 
Yes, but what should it be going forward? Yeah, I'm sure it is tough. You know, I'm sure it is tough. I get that. I think the the frustrating thing for me about the the Irish Whiskey Association is that um, they're an industry body. They represent the industry. They don't, I believe, represent the consumer. Mm. I don't think that there is, I'm not aware of consumer input into what they do. Mm. I don't think that there's anyone from the consumer um, That's interesting. community that, that, that sits on their board or anything like this, you know, so, so, you know, I feel like they're there to represent the interests of the industry um, where I feel like the industry players are the least important people in the industry. The most important people are, are us, the customers. That's great point, so I think it's, it's our interests that needs to be represented. And so, you know, I feel like as customers, we, we make the rules, you know, and, you know, we look at these, the, the controversy around some of the transparency stuff. Um, Cologne was, was a big thing that happened recently and they're, they're scratching out the, 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 the things on, on, on their bottle that was handled poorly. Um, you know, I think there was more, more, um, constructive ways that could have been, that could have been handled. Um, you know, I get that the, 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 the rules in question are EU rules and stuff like that, but I still, I still believe it was handled poorly because at the end of the day, if, if as a consumer, I want to know something, well yes. then tell me, God damn it. You know, and, and I don't want someone to, to tell me that I can't know that. I can't be told that. I'm not, I'm not entitled to know this. It's my money. Um, so, so, you know, I think, um, I think there does need to be more of a consumer voice in terms of how Irish whiskey is represented from a legal perspective, if mm. that, if I can, if I can say it that way. You know, I've never thought about it that way, Dave, that, that the, the consumer being represented. Uh, you're you right, know. Jeff. Good point. You're, you're, you're right, Jeff. It's a, it's a, it's a member's club. That's Jeff, for sure. That's also very true. There, there's a, a fable, a myth, a story, maybe true, maybe not, that Jeff Bezos, as he was growing Amazon, whenever he held leadership meetings, insisted on there being an empty chair, and the empty chair would be for the customer. And that when all of the leaders and the executives came up with ideas, Jeff Bezos would be able to point to the chair and ask, well, what would the customer want? And it was that line of thinking that allowed them to go from two week shipping to one week shipping to one hour shipping because well wouldn't the customer want that and mm -hmm. I, i've never thought of the irish whiskey industry in terms of well is there a consumer body that might be able to represent the interests of the consumers that's an inter interesting thought yeah i mean like at the end of the day we're the ones that matter you know you, you look at all of the european um geographical indicators the appalachian contrails in france the docgs and wine in, in italy um you know all these things they're they're meant to protect the consumer from from um i don't want to say malfeasance but 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 yeah you know kind of dodgy dealings do you know what i mean I so that the consumer knows what they're buying um you know you you look at a lot of the rules um about irish whiskey labeling or whiskey labeling in general yes and you know a lot of the rules are about making sure that there's no confusing confusion for the consumer and you know you read some of these rules and it's like do they think that we're stupid like right. i mean you know you know how am i getting confused as a consumer by some of the stuff that that distillers are trying to tell us and that i'm asking a distillery to tell me um you, you know the I, I just I just feel like there, there needs well, I, to I be totally some more representation from a consumer perspective. Ask I me if I'm confused. Good. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I have no doubt that when the rules for Irish whiskey were created in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, they were made with the best of intentions. Now, yeah, look back, that, yeah. like looking back, we can say, well, wasn't the protectionism to protect large distilleries? Well, the reality was that the only distilleries that wrote the rules they were the only distilleries in Ireland. There was no other, there might not yeah. have even probably hoped that at some point in the future, th these rules would be torn up. And yeah. they never could have dreamed that we could have gone from one distillery. When I was five years of age in Ireland in 1983, there was one distillery in the Republic of Ireland, Middleton. And are we surprised that they were a large author of these rules? How could we possibly be surprised? They were trying to protect well, who, the who, who, who else would the government have gone to to ask? Nobody there else. was nobody else. 
So Bush, you know, I agree. There, there's Bush, yeah, yeah, that's it. So I, I agree. I don't. I don't think that there was any conspiracy involved. No. I think the the the, the issue now is that is that you know, particularly around transparency, my own view and my view is informed by some of the industry people that, 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 that I respect because they make products that I'm interested in. My own view is that the Irish Whiskey Association could be doing more to press the transparency agenda at EU right. level. And my understanding is that my understanding is that they don't appear to be as interested as I personally would like them to be in pressing the transparency agenda and allowing for greater transparency. You know, there's a difference between requiring transparency and allowing for it. The, right. I wouldn't be saying that we should be requiring a brand to tell us A, B, C, D, or E. There's some things that I think they should be required to tell us, but not everything. But they surely Remember. should be allowed to tell us, answer the questions that we're asking them yeah. without making yeah. us dig and email the, you know, person and, you know, in reception to see can they find out something for something if i want it on the label as a customer i agree why can't i read it there you know so i feel it's like a, there's more that could be done from that respect perspective to to, to represent yeah, yeah. the consumer interest yeah it is a, a kind of a an interesting industry specific focus where consumers in the irish whiskey world and i would argue that dave you and i and the 30 or 40 other lads and ladies who interact on a regular basis on Twitter, we are absolutely the minority. Like we are this small, like super passionate group of people that make up yeah. the smallest percentage of sales for anybody. Like we're the tiniest group, but we're maybe the most vocal. But then you look at other industries where like in Ireland, and I, I get to look at this from the outside now that I don't live there anymore, but you look at things like meat production, you look at labeling in, su in supermarkets, Irish beef, or Irish chicken, but it actually was raised in Thailand and maybe was packaged in Ireland. You know Ireland what I mean? Disaster as well. You know, you, you've got like, you know, you've, you Irish chicken means it was packaged here. Right. It could have been grown, grown and killed somewhere else, shipped over, and and you know some plastic wrapped around it somewhere in Offaly, yeah. and and now it's Irish chicken. Um, so it's it's not just a whiskey thing in, in terms of the the transparency and traceability, but that's why I think that the transparency is so important, um, particularly when you have distilleries and brands that want to provide us with that transparency. God, my God, by God, let them. That's a, that's a know, good point. I mean, you know, it, it's 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 not like you've got these people are trying to hide stuff from us. These these people are trying to tell us the stuff we want to know. There's nothing dodgy going on. This is do, just. Do you letting us nerd out with them and by reading the back of the bottle you know <laughs> i think that's a great point i mean we've now got brands and distilleries who want to share more but are prevented by law whereas with the food industry that's a different story i don't imagine there's an irish chicken twitter as just like there is an irish whiskey twitter <laughs> is there an irish chicken twitter? <laughs> you find it i'm sure i'm sure there is man there's a <laughs> twitter's a funny place <laughs> You know, you know, you mentioned but you mentioned about Irish Twitter and 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 it, like, I I know we're we're run, running long here, so like I mean, feel free to cut me off at any moment. But you know, I, I do have to comment on the overall positivity of yes. the Irish whiskey community on Twitter. Uh, you know, there are kind of thirty or forty kind of I guess core people, if you want to say it that way. But and and of course, we rip the piss out of each other a good bit and stuff like that. But it, it it really is a, a a fantastic bunch of people and just a huge amount of um cooperative learning and people helping each other and you know right. the amount of the amount of whiskeys that i've had access to because of the generosity of some of the the the, the people in the community um you know tom sutton's helped me out dan pennington's helped me out omar's helped me out ivers helped me out i'm getting, leaving out loads of people so i'm gonna stop listing names because the more i list them the more offended someone's gonna be gonna left them out but, the, the the list is endless and you know there's very very little you know genuine negativity or, or, or antagonism within the community and it's 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 absolutely fantastic uh group to be to be a part of and uh you know i spend i spend a lot of my day on on irish whiskey twitter and it will okay except for that guy yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Prince. We'll bring him back in the but next it, few weeks for it. But it is, a, but it is, a, it is a fantastic community to be part of. I have to say, and and Jeff as well. I mean, like Jeff, Jeff brought me a bottle of um, Old Forester 1920 over from Michigan and left it in the Old Ground Hotel in Ennis for me. 
I remember that yeah. behind the behind the bar generously. And so so when when I went to, when I went to pick it up, myself and my wife went in and we went to have a drink. And uh, uh, the guy behind the bar, um, whom I know well, he said, "Oh, someone's left a bottle in for you." And out comes this bottle of old Porsche 1920. So that's brilliant. I said, "Now, before you give that to me, open it and pour a double for yourself, and then have nice. you, then give me the put the cork back in and then give it to me." Um, nice. But you know that that kind of spirit that we have in the in the Irish whiskey community is. I, I I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it elsewhere. It really is unique and it's and it's fantastic and it's to to, to I remember to, really um, to be treasured. I think. Oh, it's absolutely the Irish whiskey community and Irish whiskey Twitter is a beautiful thing. I remember about five years ago, I had a friend in Ohio, and he was big into bourbon. And I remember going to his house and he had all these bottles of bourbon. Like you go to the bathroom, there's bottles of bourbon on shelves. <laughs> he was a massive bourbon collector, but he had all these miniature bottles. And this was long before I got into Irish whiskey. And I said where do you get all these miniatures and samples? And he said, well, I find a way. And it took me a few years to figure out what finding a way meant. It meant you build relationships with interesting people and generous people online. And suddenly an envelope turns up at your door with a bottle inside it, a little miniature, a little sample, and then you send one back. And it's a lovely uh, little bit of illegal bootlegging that happens in the, with the best of intentions. And I hope it never, I hope it never changes. Yeah, for sure. No, uh, it's 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 a it's a great community to be part of. Lots of sharing, um, you know, and a bit of stick as well. I mean, like you have to you have to be a little bit thick skinned, you know. I mean, I can certainly dish it out, so I got to be able to take it as well. Um, but, <laughs> but we do have a great time. Yeah, I've just I'm after killing my I'm after killing my John Lane as well. Here, listen, uh, hold up your bottle there. Let me take a screen. Let me take a photograph of the two of us holding up empty bottles. This is a this is a moment right here. Whoa, there we go. <laughs> Let's see if I can get this in. There All right. Go. Two empty bottles of John's Lane. We did well. We did well. For sure. <laughs> For sure. For sure. Um, no, listen, Dave, you, uh, you are not uh, being asked to leave. Do not do not um, think you are. I just want to thank you while there are people here. I want to thank you for being so kind and generous with your time, your insight, and your perspective. I, uh, I have a lot to learn from you. Others have a lot to learn from you. And that's the beauty of this community is that there's always somebody a little bit further ahead on the journey that uh, wants to pay it uh, forward or back to the person who's coming up in that journey. And so uh, I really do thank you for uh, for joining us and for uh, giving well, us well, your... I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come on. There's certainly um, a hell of a lot of people that are much, much further along um, that particularly the Irish whiskey journey than, than I am, you know, the, the likes of Omar that you had on a, a couple of weeks ago. And there's, there's lots of others, Dave, Ivor, um, you know, the, the, the list is, is pretty much endless, but I suppose, um, you know, I, hopefully I'm able to bring some sort of a unique perspective to, to, to some of it. Well, you're the first American accent, uh, I think we've had on, uh, which, so by, for, for, for no other reason than you come from uh, the suburban Detroit, I think that is pretty unique. That's your contribution here. You know, I think you give a lot more, and I know the audience is, uh, has, has learned a lot from your your insights tonight. Well, you know, I think it's I, I think um, you know you listen to a, a, a lot of podcasts and you and you you watch some videos and stuff like that, and there are a lot of industry voices that get highlighted, which is great because I think we all want to hear from those people. We all want to all want to get their opinions and perspectives and want to pick their brains and we want to get scoops on the the new releases that no one knows about yet and stuff like that um but i i think it's 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 fun to listen to um people out of the enthusiast community you know you had omar on a couple of weeks ago i thought that was great because you know he's not coming at it from an industry perspective he's coming at it from an enthusiast right. perspective you know i hope yep. you know i'm i'm the same you know you had um laurie with his podcast uh yep. you had uh the likes of uh, dan pennington and a couple of couple of other lads on there a, a few weeks ago um they sat down for like eight or nine hours just drinking a shitload of water for the, you know I, said, I was driving from donegal to or i was driving from dublin to donegal listening to that whole thing and you know i i i i, I swear i had a cork accent by the time i got here listening to it, you know but, you lucky? <laughs> but it's but it's but it's great to it's great to hear from from people like that as well because i think you know they they can kind of pro provide um a, a voice that people can identify with because they're from the enthusiast community as opposed to the industry community yeah, and yeah. um 
and and I think that's I think I think that's I think that's nice. So I, I'm I'm delighted to be able to to come on and and, and bullshit a little bit. <laughs> I think people were a lot more afraid of you than you turned out to be in the sense of you're you're actually a very kind, gentle soul uh, and 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 thoughtful soul and. I've observed you being very firm in your beliefs, but never cruel and never mean and never mean spirited, but rather you believe a thing and you will fight it till the end. And that I can yeah. get behind all day long. Well, you know, I've got, I've got my moments and, you know, everybody in the heat of a, the heat of a discussion, um, you know, you might, you might make a comment here or there or whatever. And, you know, but, but, but I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, we, everyone in the community, no matter where you're from, we have a common interest. And, you know, if you don't, if you don't get a little bit fired up sometimes about a discussion, for me, I think it means you don't care enough. And if I you don't care enough, then do I, do I want to hear from you? Do you know what I mean? I, 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 yeah. I, yeah. So, so, you know, I think maybe, maybe sometimes online it can come off, it can come off a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit hardcore, but, but, but as you really I try to, um, I try to be a bit more thoughtful in person, perhaps. <laughs> I think you've, you've ruined the illusion now. You're uh, you're actually the, the teddy bear of Irish whiskey, not the grizzly bear. And that's... Uh, <laughs> that's what I've said a lot of people. <laughs> well, if you can tell me that I'm the Barbara Walters of Irish whiskey, you're the teddy bear of Irish whiskey. So that's it. Is that it? Okay. Well, that's... <laughs> Excuse me, that's it. Excellent. Uh, um, we've got quite a few folks still sticking around, 50, 60 people still tuned in. Uh, what tends to happen, Dave, is over the course of the live stream, we get 800, 700, 800, 900 people tune in live. And then over the next week, anywhere from three to 8,000 people will watch the replay. So um, no stress That's unbelievable, there. Man. That's unbelievable. Um, unbelievable. But it's a good time. And I, I think people enjoy the crack. And I, I want to bring more people on who, who, who want to have the crack and are interesting. Um, it would be remiss of me at this late stage of a lock-in I, I I might get a negative response, but it would be remiss of me not to ask, have you an old song? I have not. No, absolutely <laughs> not. No, no. I made a promise to myself and to all of the other people in the house that I would not. Because <laughs> after all, it is 2.30 two, two, two in the morning here. We've, we've, we've visitors that have come up from, from Galway, from Hedford, oh, rather, uh, and, and their kids are here. And um, so I'm not going to... Plus, I don't know. I don't know a lot of Irish songs, man. Like I know a few. I know a few rebel songs, but I, I, I don't know if this is that kind of show, you know. So I, I'll just. What's a good Michigan song? <laughs> like curiously, like what is a? What, is... Well, I mean, there's the old Michigan fight song, but there's far too many Ohio people on here for me to be able to do that. So I'm gonna. <laughs> Wasn't there a battle back in the 1800s over Toledo? Wasn't Toledo the uh, this outcrop uh, bit of land that both that's where the rivalry came from, isn't it? Between Michigan and Ohio was was Toledo. Yeah, I think they didn't want it, and we told them that they had to keep it. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was some something to do with that. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking for songs during the week that had reference to Michigan. And there's one song that came up that I love, which is Simon and Garfunkel, um, America, where they mention Michigan and they mention Saginaw. And that is a beautiful song. It is far too beautiful a song for me to butcher. But I know, times, no. I, and I've butchered many songs in my past and will butcher many more in the future. But I... I couldn't dare try a song like that, but I couldn't find many songs that mention Michigan. And a few people mentioned to me during the week, we should be singing Ohio fight songs like Hang On Sloopy and, oh, you know, the um, Carmen, Ohio, the uh, the alma mater song from Ohio State. But we won't do that to you. No, no, thank you. I appreciate that. Now, one that would have been a good one, if I knew the words, which I don't, is there's one by a fellow called Gordon Lightfoot, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. I'm sure yeah. Jeff Adams probably knows that one. It's a great and song. Interesting, and interestingly, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that I know a couple of Rebel songs. You know, um, Bobby Sands' song, uh, Back Home in Derry, I think that was his poem, is actually sung to the tune of the, of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the, 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 I'm not far from Derry, I'm about 20 minutes away, so I suppose. Um, That's a great tune. But yeah, so I guess there's, I guess there is, I guess there is that. Michigan wanted access to the rivers they can port into Ohio. The lake. The, okay. Yeah, it, it sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, Jeff. we also just didn't, we didn't want to leave over. 
Jeff was in Ann Arbor this evening, uh, p- picking up bottles and past the stadium on the way to Stadium Market. So my dad went to University of Michigan, and when I was three years old, um, he was he was a, he was a student there, and he used to um, he used to have these late night um, biology labs that he used to have to go to. So he would take me. So I thought that, you know, I was three years old. I thought I went to Michigan. Like, you know, I would tell my friends in kindergarten two years later. They're like, oh, we're in kindergarten, but I've already, I already went to Michigan. I thought I was, <laughs> I thought it was a big, thought it was a big deal, man. Yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's an area in Detroit, uh, a very famous Irish built area called Corktown. Yeah, you familiar with Cork? Is, yeah, yeah. yeah, vaguely, vaguely. So you know, the thing, the sad thing about Detroit is that. You know, ever since the late '60s, it's um, it, it's been in this constant state of like descent and decline, yeah. um, and it's it's it, it's very sad. Now, I will say that in the last number of years, like it's maybe the last seven or eight years, you know, 25 years ago, I always we always said, "Oh, Detroit's coming back," and then five years later, it hadn't come back yet. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. but now now I mean I, I, maybe it might be different with COVID I don't know and I haven't been able to go back unfortunately but you know last time I was downtown was probably two and a half years ago and you know all of a sudden you're starting to see a lot of places opening up there's a lot of restaurants a lot of bars a lot of shops I mean it used to be if you go downtown there were no grocery stores you had to go to the suburbs to get to a grocery store so um, you know yeah. when I was when I was living there because I moved here in 2003. Um, you know, we didn't go downtown an awful lot. We'd go for sporting events. Yeah. And we'd go for a Wings game. We'd go for a Tigers game. You know, we'd go for the for the for the Lions. You know, after they moved from Pontiac, um, and you know the Pistons are there now with Little Caesars. But that was this was before that. But other than that, unfortunately, like we didn't go downtown an awful lot. So, um, you know, I think people now are probably an awful lot more familiar with with those places than we would have been back when I was in you know, in the mid nineties or late nineties, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the last few years, I think Detroit has done a remarkable job of concentrating all of their activities around one central area, like the sporting area of Detroit. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. It's, it's a fantastically built area of Detroit where yeah. everything is there. Bars, restaurants, and stadia are all in one walkable. I like you said stadia as the plural of stadium. I, I, Fair play to you for that one. I went to school. I went to school. Um, <laughs> I had an education. Uh, yeah, but I've, I was very impressed about that with Detroit. And also the revitalization that Ford is doing of the magnificent building, the train station and the hotel building uh, there in, in near in Corktown, which I know has played a big role in like M&M videos, music videos, etc. But Ford is putting some money into that, which would be great to see that being fully restored as well. Yeah, yeah, that train that train station is a is a cool building. So like that's a, you know, back when I was there, what people would do is, is sneak in, because it was like a dilapidated, almost like a ruin. But but this building of like kind of former grandeur and magnificence. Yeah. And so people would sneak in, even though it was basically a condemned site, and you know they they'd sneak in and 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 take all these pictures. Um, a guy I know called Rod, who used to go out with a cousin of mine. They used to they used to sneak in and they take take some amazing pictures, fascinating pictures of the, the the history and the architectural beauty of those places, and even some of the old houses, which are now sadly abandoned. And you see kind of trees growing up through the roofs of them. Um, yeah, there's, there's 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 quite a lot of history there, you know. So you'd you'd, you'd hate to see that go away completely. So it, it's good to see some of these buildings, some of these buildings being restored, um, especially that train station. It's such a it's such a cool building. It's iconic. It really is. Um, I don't think we've ever had a lock-in go this late. I don't think we've ever gone to two thirty in the morning in Ireland or three thirty, whatever. What is it? Two thirty in the morning? Yeah. I have, I, I'm told that I have a problem shutting up. So <laughs> <laughs> this is normally the part of the night where, um, in order for me to press end broadcast, I have to sing a song of which I'm ill-qualified to do. But I do it just to just to exit from stage right. Um, but it's uh, very disappointing to know there'll be no Michigan songs tonight. I'm sure our audience will be absolutely devastated. I'm sure they will be. I'm sure they will be. But I've been disappointing people my entire life. My parents, no, 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 none more so than my parents. So, so why would I? Why stop now? <laughs> why, why stop a good thing now? So, but look, I guess look, I'll, I'll, I'll finish up here as, as, as well. It's about it's about two thirty. I'm I'm sure I've kept everyone in the house awake. Um, Listen. 
You're a and good I, man. And, and, and I have to probably not pour any more whiskey today. I got to get up in the morning and be some kind of sociable. So, but we'll, David, we'll, I will we'll leave it there. But I'm, I'm incredibly grateful of your time, your 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 perspective, your honesty, and your kindness uh, with me and with our audience tonight. There's been some great comments. I'd encourage you tomorrow, even just look back through the comments. There's six or 700 of them at this stage. There'll be more over next week. Just go back through and look at them. They're, it's just lovely to see the interest in the guests and in Irish whiskey. And uh, it's, it's just lovely to see that dialogue happening in the, in the comments. As you and I are busy talking, there's some lovely conversations tend to happen in the comments and people are just having their own little side. I can't side see any of those. I can't yes. see any of those, thank God, yeah. because I'd be, I'd be looking really at nice. them. Like. <laughs> uh, it's really nice to see. Um, and look, we've got Stephen joining us, um, Irish whiskey uh, and brand ambassador there who's joining very late. God knows where he's been oh. until this time of the night. He's only just coming on now. You're only just joining now. You're about three hours too late, Steve. But you'll catch I was the replay. Get, I was hoping he'd be doing some heckling, actually, from the background. I was, I was hoping he'd have a couple of couple of comments for me. <laughs> That's a heckling replay mode. But, Stephen, for you, we'll, we'll once again announce that next week is a Kilbegan takeover of the live stream, which I'm really excited for. We're going to be drinking the small batch rye. We're going to be drinking the single pot still with oats. We're going to be drinking the uh, Kilbegan blend. And we're going to have musical guests. We're going to have trivia. We're going to have giveaways. We've got T-shirts, caps. It's going to be a lot of fun. I've been working with the team at Kilbegan to put this together. And uh, I hope to do more things like that. So, uh, Stephen, I hope you'll tune in for that next week. But, uh, Dave, you've been uh, a legend. And you've uh, you have Thanks absolutely for having me on, Barry. I've enjoyed it. I've thoroughly yeah. enjoyed it. Thank you. And we, Next time we do this, let's do this in person together, sitting in the corner of a bar having the crack and drinking 47 whiskeys together. Sounds absolutely fantastic, man. Dave, you're a legend. Sláinte, my friend. We'll chat to you Good soon. Night, man. Good night. All the best. Thanks a million, Dave. Mihua. Mihua, man. What a legend, David Mara. I'm delighted that we had him on. Um, you know, when I started the live stream, I never had the idea that we'd bring on Irish whiskey fans and not just people from the Irish whiskey industry. Uh, but it's really been a remarkable opportunity to get inside people's heads and understand how they think about whiskey and understand their perspectives and what they like and they don't like and i'm going to bring on a lot more people so look i have no formal structure to this over the next few months in terms of every second week will be a whiskey fan or every second week will be a distillery but what i do every week is when i'm not trying to earn a living with my day job is um trying to figure out how do i make the most of this channel and how do i bring the most people on that'll be some fun and how do i bring on people to the podcast that'll be a bit of crack as well so um yeah i think we had a great time great session tonight i hope you enjoyed it uh we didn't get him to sing but listen we can't have everything we're two hours and 37 minutes into a live stream i think we're breaking all kinds of records tonight i'm delighted that you all hung out for so long for the 40, 50, 60 of you that are still here, thank you for your company. Um, I'm delighted. Caroline asks me to please post those Twitter hashtags that I mentioned. Let me throw those up here for you. So the Irish whiskey community gathers around a number of hashtags on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Friday night dram is one. And I'm 85 whiskeys in, Caroline, so you're going to have to excuse me as I type. Saturday night sip, and then Sunday night sup. I would encourage you to check out these hashtags. And if you are from the United States and you join in with these hashtags, do me a favor and tell them that Irish Whiskey Barry or Stories and Sips sent you. Those are the hashtags. Friday night dram, Saturday night sip, and Sunday night, oh, oh that says Sunday night sip as well. It should be Sunday night sup. Let me change that. That'll tell you how many whiskeys I've had. No, that's still not right. Saturday night, Sunday night. Sup, there we go. Friday night dram, Saturday night sip, and Sunday night sup. Brian says, such a big and growing community, and it's great to give voice to all sides, even if I disagree with some. Absolutely, Brian. I disagree with many people that I meet on a daily basis and I won't stop giving them a voice. And I'll do the same here with Irish whiskey. And, and I'm hoping that um, we'll have more diverse opinions from both sides, from the industry side and the audience side over the coming months. Uh, Daniel asks me to add cask strength crusade to that as well. 
Yep, absolutely. Follow those hashtags. Tune in on Twitter. Irish people, you are legendary for staying up so late. I can't believe it. Actually, you're crazy. You're lunatics. Um, when you could catch this as a replay, um, it's not lost on me. A little bit of my heart is very happy and delighted that you do stick around, and especially Daniel and JP and Laurie and all my Cork buddies there who fly the uh, the red and white flag for Cork. Thank you genuinely for staying in and uh, accompanying me on this little journey as we talk to interesting people. If there are interesting people you'd like to hear from or I should bring on, should do me a favor and let me know. You can put it in the comments. You can send me um, a message. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram. Before I wind down tonight, uh, let me remind you of a couple of things. The first is that uh, we have a great podcast chat this week with uh, Mr. John Quinn, a 46-year veteran of the Irish whiskey industry. You don't find many of those. Um, John Quinn is the global brand ambassador for Tullamore Dew, and I had the wonderful privilege, pleasure. Honestly, I said this to John on the phone, that, and he, he chided me and said, will you stop? I said, John, it is an honor to talk to you. He said, stop it. You're embarrassing me. In any case, John has been 46 years in the Irish whiskey industry and has a lot to share, has great perspectives, and has seen the rise, the, well, the roller coaster ride of Irish whiskey from the 1970s to today. And he is a man we want to listen to. Every brand ambassador across the world who represents Irish whiskey today stands on the shoulders of people like John Quinn. And I am genuinely, like, it, it elates me and gives me such incredible fulfillment that I get to have conversations with these people because we're getting a snapshot into a snapshot of different time periods of Irish whiskey history. And that is absolutely priceless. The second thing I want to share with you is the Irish whiskey that we are releasing ourselves. Thanks to the growing community that is building up around our stories and sips community and our Irish whiskey lock in live stream on a Friday Last week on the live stream, Louise McGuan, founder of JJ Curry Whiskey Bonders, came on to share the story of the lock-in, her blend that was released this week, but also to announce the release over the coming months of our very own whiskey called The Story. And The Story is a celebration of the story of Irish whiskey, the story of the growing Irish whiskey community. And we are going to document the growth of that over the coming weeks on our Facebook group, Irish Whiskey Fans of America, and on Stories and Sips Facebook page. So stay tuned. The, I've been working over the last two days with Louise and with Larry, our partner in California, on the labeling and on the bottle sizes and on the composition of the whiskey. And I'm due to get some samples over the coming week to start evaluating the blends. So I'm really excited about that. So we'll share that journey as well with you. As Joe says, sure, we're all going to heaven, lads. Hey, we are indeed. <laughs> uh, so listen, thank you all for joining in. It's been a fantastic night. Almost three hours we went. Um, the time flies when you're drinking 76 whiskeys. Who knew? Tune in next week, ladies and gentlemen, next week for the Kilbegan takeover of the live stream. I cannot wait. I've been planning this for a few months, and I'm delighted to bring it to fruition. And we're going to do more things like that over the coming months with distilleries and brands, but it's going to be an exciting time. So thank you all for sticking around. Thank you for joining in. I'm going to sign off tonight. Um, three hours in, I don't think there's any point at this stage of a song, really, is there? Is there any? <laughs> Mark says the best way to spend a Friday these days. These days, Mark, surely every week, <laughs> as opposed to these days. No, but I do understand. I do. I do. All right. A verse of the Owl Triangle to sing us out. Otherwise, what are we even doing here? A verse of the Owl Triangle. All right. One more tune, says Brian. All right. A tune to sing us out. Here we go. Um, I've sneakily uh, opened, and don't tell the kind people of Kilbegan, I've sneakily opened the Kilbegan single pot still, and I poured myself a little drop in here, and I have no apologies for it. But um, why not? I might as well get a head start on it before next week. Mm, very interesting. All right. So we're going to sing an old drop. All right. Jesus. You're, honest to God, you get no peace here with the, the, the demand for the tunes. 
It is a tradition. It is. It's a tradition. It is. All right. A little bit of our triangle because that's normally how we end our in-person tastings. For those of you who have been to my Ohio tastings or Washington DC tastings, uh, we end with a little rendition of the owl triangle. So here we go. A hungry feeling came o'er me stealing, and the mice were squealing in my prison cell, and the old triangle can jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal. To begin the morning, the screw was bawling. Get up, you bowsy, and clean out your cell. And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal. Up in the female prison, there are 75 women, and amongst those women, I wish I did dwell. And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal. And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal. All along the banks of the Royal Canal. You! Up your bio, the Owl Triangle by Brendan Bean. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining in with the singing and with everything else. Um, I butcher that every night, but listen, I'm not going to stop because it's a bit of crack. Slauncha, Daniel, you're a legend. My quality for staying up so late. Maureen in Canada, fair play to you. Brian in Cincinnati. Johnny up there in, uh, are you in, you're in New York or New Jersey, Johnny? But listen, fair play to you all for joining in. Brian, Zebeka, uh, Rebecca, Zebeka, Rebecca Zobek, thank you. Slauncha, I will see you in the Irish Whiskey Fans of America Facebook group this week. And I'll see you next week for Kilbegan. Slaunch, everybody.